State Board of Education meeting. Board members, please engage your microphones before speaking and turn them off when you're done speaking. Please note that the board members may be using their cell phones and laptop computers to access the agenda and other information related to this meeting. Live web streaming is available through the State Board of Education website. Laura, will you call the roll, please? Patsy Kojans? Here. Lisa Fricke? Here. Patty Goobles? Jacqueline Morrison? Here. Kirk Penner? Here. Marie Nichols? Here. Robin Stevens? Here. Deborah Neary? Here. Commissioner Bloomstead? Here. Seven present, one absent. The March 4th, 2020 State Board meeting will now come to order. Patty Goobles contacted me in advance to let me know she would not be, that she would be absent from today's meeting. Agenda item 1.2. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 1.3, information regarding the Open Meetings Act is posted as you enter the room from the main entrance door. The Open Meetings Act is also posted on the State Board of Education website. Item 1.4, meeting protocol. Commissioner? Yeah, welcome everyone to the uh, March meeting of the State Board of Education. Uh, appreciate folks being here. Uh, we don't have any specific COVID protocols, which I know you're smiling because I can see your faces, but the uh, just be respectful and mindful of the other people's needs at this point in time. I also just want to share that, you know, remember this is a public meeting of the State Board of Education. Please be respectful of the board's processes and, and the opportunity for you to be observing the meeting. Obviously, we want folks to silence cell phones and try to avoid other distractions that could uh, kind of impact how the flow of the meeting goes and then ultimately please show respect for one another when public comment time does come and make sure that that we can hear from all people that that, that are uh, um, wanting to be able to be heard so thank you all for being here again agenda item point two point one commissioner yeah I'm gonna invite up Lane Carr to make this introduction uh, um, appreciate this opportunity. We're going to share a little bit about some of the uh, ESSER funds investments in, with uh, one of the uh, partners that we've had. And I'll let Lane do the introductions. Thanks, Lane. You bet. Good morning, board. I'm very excited to introduce uh, partners from the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation over the past several years. And even before the time of, of COVID-19 and our ESSER investments, we've had a strong relationship with the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation and have been really excited to see that grow and deepen um, over the last couple of years. We also want to make sure that we're spending some time talking about the impact that the investments that we've made with our uh, statewide set aside funds for, uh, for the ESSER dollars. And so um, I, I'm going to be quiet and introduce to you the CEO and president of the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation, Mary Jo Pancoke the Senior Vice President at the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation, Dr. Joshua Kramer, and Joe DeCostanzo, the Assistant Vice President for Post-Secondary Education. And they're gonna share with you a little bit of the good news of our Together Better initiative. So, welcome. Good morning and thank you for your public service on behalf of children and families in Nebraska. We appreciate it. Uh, my name is Mary Jo Pancoke and I am the president and CEO of the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. For 25 years, the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation has worked with public and private partners to create positive change for Nebraska's children through community engagement. We envision a Nebraska where all children have all the supports and resources uh, they need to thrive. 
At our core, we believe in strengthening families before problems start. We were founded on that principle of prevention and it is still our primary motivation today. For many years, we have partnered with the Nebraska Department of Education, applying our belief that quality education is a critical prevention tool. Prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the focus of our partnership with NDE was primarily on early childhood education and after school time. Once we all began to realize the truly devastating impacts that the pandemic would have on the academic and life success of children and families, we met with NDE to discuss how we might be able to support additional efforts to recover some of what we have lost and accelerate learning into the future. A critical part of that work was to reach out to our 22 community collaboratives and work with them to develop what we called community playbooks. The playbooks highlighted the needs being seen in communities across the state and also contained uh, proposed solutions. Since then, we have taken several steps with communities to support children and families. One of the most important things that came out of that collaborative effort was an expansion of our partnership with the department to connect community needs with departmental goals and apply Nebraska children resources where gaps exist. That alignment has become known as the Together Better Partnership between the Nebraska Department of Education and NCFF. And at this point, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Josh Kramer. Uh, Josh serves as a senior vice president at Nebraska Children. So Josh. All right, this moves. All right, well, thank you, Mary Jo. And thanks to the board members for all the work you do on behalf of children and families. When we heard about the strategic priorities that the Nebraska Department of Education had set, and crosswalk those with what communities thought that they needed in those community playbooks that Mary Jo uh, referenced, we were able to work with the department to align our resources accordingly. At the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation, we work all across the lifespan to support the success of Nebraska children and families. While our work aligns with many of the departmental priorities, when the department wanted to reimagine family and community engagement, we knew we had found a cornerstone for our Together Better partnership. We have always known that schools cannot be successful alone. It takes whole communities to support children and families in reaching their full potential. This is true in both rural and urban school districts. And if we have learned anything during the pandemic, it is that families are at the center of the, our education infrastructure, both in Nebraska <clears throat> and in our country. And given that we have now acknowledged that families are at the center, we thought that we needed to think about how we could step up with the department. So in an effort to more deliberately include families and communities in the education system, we have worked to create a position that will focus completely on family and community engagement. We have also sought to build momentum on our strategic partnership called the Nebraska Statewide Family Engagement Center, which includes the Nebraska Department of Education, the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation, and the National Center for Families Learning. Nebraska is only one of 12 states in the whole country that has a statewide family engagement center. So by working together better, we will make sure that all Nebraska children and families are fully engaged in the educational process. We also sought to think about the importance of early literacy and the development of young children. To that end, we've also partnered with the department to seed and support additional family literacy programs that work with both adults and children and bring them together to learn on a mutual quest to reach their academic and life goals. Another step we took was to create positions focused both on early literacy and early math as key areas to foster brain development during those incredibly important early years. We knew that motivating children and youth to accelerate their learning would take traditional and non-traditional educational strategies both in and outside of the traditional school day. To that end, we worked with our worked through our Beyond School Bells initiative to support districts in implementing innovative before and after school programming. And I'm very excited to share with you that we have billed summer 2022 as the best summer ever. With that, my colleague and Nebraska Children Vice President Joe D. Costanzo will share a little bit more about that. Joe.
Thank you, Josh and Mary Jo and the board for all your work on behalf of Nebraska children and families. We know a well-designed and well-delivered summer enrichment and comprehensive after-school programming can address learning loss, accelerate learning, and expand opportunities for student success. These efforts are strengthened even further when combined with a community schools approach. From the American Rescue Plan, substantial new funding for after school and summer learning is now available to communities for the next three years. These funds are provided through the provisions in the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER III, and can be used to expand and improve existing summer and after school programs and partnerships to start new programs that are aligned with the priorities identified in the Nebraska State Board of Education Quality Framework. We see this as a part of a major effort to support and elevate high quality, locally powered after school and summer programs across the state. This started with the Department of Health and Human Services and Nebraska Children partnering to provide support directly to existing providers during the pandemic. As a part of our Together Better partnership, NDE has matched this DHH effort, which will increase capacity to start new and expand existing after school and summer programs over the next two and a half years. We will be conducting this with a major statewide marketing campaign and combined partnership with NDE to facilitate new opportunities to engage in before school, after school, and summer career exposures ideas to build and sustain high quality programs across the state through the ELO Innovation Network. The ultimate goal is to take advantage of the unprecedented attention that after school and extended learning opportunity programs received during the pandemic to build a broad base of statewide support for more high quality locally sustained after school and summer programs serving the kids who need these services the most across the state. NDE and Nebraska Children are also collaborating to address critical basic needs for students, families, and communities through the Full Service Community School Partnership Pilot Project. Community schools are a collaborative strategy, not a program, that organize community resources to best support the success of students. Community schools are about building relationships. The school serves as a hub that strengthens neighborhoods, families, students, and the community to help improve student achievement. Community schools form strategic partnerships within the community and at the state to leverage resources that support student families and communities. Our community school partnership has started in four communities, Fremont, Grand Island, Schuyler, and South Sioux City. All four sites began their implementation of the work in September 2021. NDE and Nebraska Children provided strategic support to build learning cohorts across the four locations, define a shared understanding of community schools, specifically identify the results that they are working towards, and understand the current conditions of each community, and develop key strategies to accelerate the work. Each of the four sites has created plans and started the implementation of strategies that will accelerate student learning and development, family and community engagement, and partnership development. In Grain Island, at the O'Connor Learning Center, the half-day preschool program has partnered with the YWCA to provide childcare for the other half of the day. This was identified by families as a high need at their beginning of the year survey. The full service community school model has helped this site start a parent advisory group where parents are coming together, planning events, collaborating to show appreciation for the teachers of their children. In Schuyler, at Schuyler Elementary, in collaboration with the school nurse and community partners, a mobile optometrist clinic was brought to the school. This allowed students who were identified as needing glasses but faced barriers such as cost, transportation, and translation to improve their vision, which was necessary to succeed in school. In South Sioux City at Dakota Elementary, full service community school models has strengthened parent involvement in learning. The school has provided guest speakers on mental health and strategies to support their students and themselves as they cope with the added stressors caused by the pandemic. From the efforts of the school and the site coordinator, Dakota Elementary parents have now formed an empowered parents group to help support the school, students, teachers, and neighborhood. Finally, in Fremont, at Fremont Middle School, full service community school work has supported their strategic planning for middle school programming, where they've connected families with the Nebraska Extension Health and Nutrition classes. They've developed a program for tutoring and mentoring that involved the Fremont High School Key Club students, and they've also worked with the Heartland Workers Center to engage adults in adult education. We are starting to see the success of our partnership and it has been displayed in the lives of our families and students. We're excited to continue to share the stories of success and improved outcomes as these partnerships continue to grow between schools, families, and communities. We appreciate the opportunity today to share with you our progress and thank you for all your work on behalf of Nebraska children and families.
thank you very much. Um, if we have any questions or discussion, Deborah. Thank you. <clears throat> I've just long been a fan of the work that you guys do across Nebraska. So thank you for all you do and thank you for stepping up at this crucial time. Um, because I'm kind of a nerd about these things, I have a few questions, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, somewhere along the way, I think we heard that some of the program you're doing is going to help facilitate some mental health and emotional health supports for youth. Can you speak to that, please? And then I have more questions, but. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the question. And um, as we know, uh, every sort of um, physical health, mental health, social health situation is really unique. Mm -hmm. We understand that uh, the pandemic has caused a lot of additional uh, stressors. So particularly in our community schools, our full service community school work, we know that schools can't do it alone. Teachers can't be academic instructors, mm -hmm. counsel, the best counsel, all those sorts of things. Um, so we've strategically partnered with opportunities to connect through the community collaboratives to community response. So when a young person is identified as um, potentially needing some mental or behavioral health support services that go beyond what the school currently offers, our site coordinators can then refer to them to Central Navigation to get additional layers of professional support and potentially provide the funding should that be necessary so that young person and family can receive the services that they need. Does that mean there's there's more access to mental health support and counselors than through these funds, would you say, directly? Yeah, particularly, and I'm gonna speak specific to the Full Service Community Schools Initiative, okay. Um, okay. and there's a variety of other ways okay. beyond those four sites that the collaboratives are supporting schools. Um, most of the time, it's, it's an access to the resource that's available and filling in any gaps that should be met. So the access is greater to what is already existing within um, the, the community. And so sometimes it does become, I don't know how I'm gonna pay for this for my child. I don't know how, um, I don't know who to go to for this mm -hmm. outside of the school. So mm -hmm. the school can support best they can, but then also additionally layer on resources. Long way of saying yes, <laughs> there okay. are more. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I keep going or is that all right? Okay. Was there, okay. you for the oh it's on okay thank you um it's amazing all that you've accomplished in the past and now with this additional money how much more you can do and with the pilots at Fremont Schuyler and South Sioux City um, using these ESSER three uh, funds what might your next steps in expanding that after you've seen what the pilots have been able to accomplish no. Okay. All right. These two people are much smarter than I am, so I always want to check with them. They always have great things to add as well. Um, so currently in these uh, four communities, they're specifically at a site, one elementary school, one preschool, well, elementary school, elementary school, preschool, and middle school. Uh, long term, community schools framework has a continuum of supports at every building or site, right? Should that be the case? So um, by demonstrating this process of strategic partnership and connecting existing resources to communities and families through the school as a resource hub, we're, we're hoping to provide great examples for why it's important to expand sites. Now, uh, continued funding, right, for the personnel um, is gonna be a question, I think, that communities are gonna wanna try to decide how they wanna do that, if they wanna continue to do it, to what level. But speaking with the four sites, there really is, has been an appetite for a sort of, can we get this at the school my child is going to next? Particularly at the preschool in Grand Island. Um, mm -hmm. Valerie, who does a tremendous job and everything that she does as a site coordinator. Um, families have been asking uh, Ms. Richards, the principal, there's not a Valerie at the elementary school. And okay. so that's an example of the appreciation of the supports that, that families are receiving from that site coordinator. But there are questions about um, how are we gonna do this in the long term at more sites, which I think is generally a question that is asked of most programs that, most pilot programs that have shown success. Please. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks for the question. Just to add a little bit to what Joe said, we, we very much hope that we can hold these up as model demonstration sites. Um, part, of, part of the beauty of the partnership and the foresight of the commissioner here is that we, are, we have these 22 collaboratives across the state that are really poised to try to embrace the ideas around full service community schools. And so we think that this will catch on. We know it's already in a lot of the language at the community level. Um, and, you know, full service community schools can be funded by existing federal funds should school districts decide mm -hmm. to do that. So we really want to hold up models of success and then think that it might catch on um, across our state. So Because that's a push from, you know, nationally with community schools and all the services that are available for students. So I hope it catches fire as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I have a few questions, and so I'm going to try to ask them succinctly. Um, going through the documentation that was provided, I see a lot of words that says across the state. I believe one of them is targeted communities. Another is youth negatively affected, historically underserved communities. And so when I look on page one, I see Fremont, Grand Island, South Sioux City, Schuyler. I don't really see Omaha. And so my one, one question that I had is, as you um, have partnered with NDE and are going to be receiving the ESSER money, are you getting direction from DED on which communities to target or that they want, we want to see targeted, or is that completely in your discretion? So that's one of my questions. The second question that I have is more of a philosophical question, and one of the parents who was here at the last meeting raised it in public comment, and it's something that I've always kind of wondered about myself. A lot of the words in here, uh, innovation, new, uh, it says we're gonna be looking for designing, piloting, kind of starting a lot of new things and then it's going to be tested and we're going to see how it does and one of my concerns is it seems like we're always testing and innovating on poor kids mm -hmm. and so if we're getting money and we know some things are tried and true and that they do work is it your organizational philosophy that because we have this excess funds we're gonna try all of these new things. And then what happens if they're not as impactful or successful as if we had done what we know works? Why, I guess, philosophically do you do the innovation on the kids who have the most amount of need? Very good questions. Um, I think the, to your first point about how our communities or sites selected, um, that is done with these dollars in direct partnership with the Department of Education and also, again, with our community collaboratives. So we never do anything in a community unless that community wants it to be done there. Um, and with the breadth of our partnership with NCFF and NDE, we also bring, that being the foundation, additional um, dollars that match some of these funds. And so not all of the sites that you're seeing there, that doesn't represent everything that the ESSER funds are doing. It all, we also have additional funds that communities invest through those community collaboratives to support that work. So we do have a lot of work in Omaha. If it doesn't come through on there, you know, we could definitely provide some examples of that. Um, and the good question that you ask about testing on low-income populations or underserved populations, uh, I want to be clear that everything that is in that pack and everything we're doing is based on evidence. So it might be the first time that we've done a full-service community school in Fremont, but we know the research behind full-service community schools is strong, uh, both nationally and in Nebraska. So there is nothing in there that we're trying uh, based, that is not based on some kind of research or evidence. That's not something that we would believe in at the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. If it is new and innovative, it might be new and innovative in Nebraska or in that community. So there's a high likelihood that these things will be successful. Indeed, that was part of um, what we had to prove to the department to receive these funds. So if we misled with some language, that's something we can look at, but um, we might be testing things for the first time in a given environment, but everything is evidence-based.
guess it's better. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think your other point was around um, having parents and um, the families that actually receive the services be involved in what services are provided. And we work, that's something that we truly believe at Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. And we're working very hard with communities to make sure that families are at the table in communities when decisions are made about what um, services are provided and how best to provide those services. So that's an excellent point and it is something that we believe very strongly about. Deborah. Okay, one last question. Uh, I'm curious about the, the long-term sustainability after our COVID relief funds are gone. Can you speak to that, please? So that's something that is on the top of our mind as well. And I think working with the foundation, we are able to match some of these public funds with private funds, but that still won't be all we need to do to sustain these practices. We hope that districts make choices uh, after seeing the success to reallocate potentially some of their own federal funds to do some of these best practice models. We don't know if that's gonna happen. We never do anything ahead of what communities want, but um, in some ways we are hoping that we will change the way we do business and adopt those high impact strategies that many of which are being funded today through stimulus dollars. Any other questions or discussion? Yes, Kirk. How are you measuring success? So I'll start and I think Joe can go specifically into the full service community school, but we, everything that we're doing has a, an evaluation component. And so we partner with both, we have our internal evaluation team at the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. And then we also work with third party evaluators to make sure that we're not just telling ourselves that we're doing a good job. Uh, but um, all of our work with the department has an evaluation component and we have to do reporting, reporting out on those results, whether they're there or not. So at some point you will, you'll have in your hands, if you want it, um, a copy of our evaluation reports for each of these different initiatives. And maybe Joe, if you wanna go a little deeper into full service. Yeah, in, in, in partnership with the four full service sites, um, we have taken the National Community School Standards um, that, that have been out there and research-based and proven to be effective in supporting kids and families. And we've bucketed it into the three areas in which the communities told us they wanted to work on and identify and align with their local school improvement plan around student learning and development, uh, partnership health, so the school's partnership with the community, and family engagement. We are co-creating with those four sites a self-evaluation rubric that uses existing school data and, and numbers and uh, statements, qualitative and quantitative data to help paint the picture on how this process and this strategy has impacted um, kids in schools and communities. Have you ever had anything that didn't work? You yeah. have, okay. Yeah, yeah, certainly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, it's not a one size fits all approach. Some uh, some communities may implement with deeper fidelity uh, an after school program model. Other places may not. And so we have had instances where we've not reached um, that bar that we would like to see. We call that failing forward. You know, we like to learn from our mistakes and then move forward. I mean, we certainly try to avoid that, but not everything works uh, perfectly. Maureen. Grand Island is in my district, and I, and I am most pleased with the Early Childhood Learning Center that has been developed there um, with the great partnership of Ray O'Connor in our community there. Um, there is a parent advisory group that they have started there. Do the other three uh, districts that you're working with, have, have they developed a parent advisory so there is that parent input, which I believe is so important to have? Yes, and the site coordinators that are the hub of the full service community schools, that's the first charge and that's the first discussion was, how can we continue to authentically engage with parents and families, not just the ones that regularly show up, you know, for, for a variety of different purposes, but how can we be thoughtful about reaching parents who have a full plate already and to spend an extra hour or two 
um, at, a, at a PTA meeting. Their voice is important too, even though they can't spend the time. So the conversations with site coordinators and building leaders have been really robust around how can we continue to communicate and gain input from families. Yep. Yeah, one little thing. Um, and outside of just the full service community school pilot sites, um, I just wanted to shine a light on the fact that Nebraska has a statewide family engagement center, which also does work in Grand Island and is connected with the Department of Education to a statewide advisory committee that is comprised of 50% parent voice. And so that also is a part of what guides our work uh, with the department, especially around re reimagining family and community engagement. Uh, just to expand on that, with that statewide parental advisory group, do you also include those parents that may not always be as accessible as we would like uh, to ensure that we have all voices at the table? That is a huge focus of that work. It's actually required in the federal grant program that 65% of the families that we work with come from low income, ethnically diverse backgrounds. On our end and on the end of the statewide family engagement center, we have to be culturally and linguistically responsive. And so we pay close attention that meetings are held at the right time, that we have language support services in place, and that generally we're doing this in a way that would include all families, not just uh, maybe families who typically show up. Thank you for all your work. You make a difference. Robin. A personal note. Um, I was superintendent at Schuyler for 13 years and uh, 2006 uh, we provided uh, early childhood opportunities for all four-year-olds and uh, obviously it's still very near and dear to me and I stay in touch with many of those people uh, I know Superintendent Hazing very well and uh, he speaks very highly of your work there and I just wanted to say thank you for that Well, obviously, um, everybody on the board is interested in what you're doing. So uh, thank you for what you're doing for children across the state. And um, we'll be watching and waiting to hear again what your results are. So please come back to do that. And um, we're grateful that, that you're here in Nebraska making lives better for children that we work with, too. Thank you. Uh, I want to offer one thank you too. So Mary Jo and I, before certainly before the pandemic, had many conversations about how we could build a similar relationship as the Department of Health and Human Services has. So it's actually allowing us to leverage resources. Schools can't do everything, as we talked about. And DHHS and their work with us, they say they can't do everything. And so um, I, I really appreciate the hard work that's gone into this effort, but overall the models that we can de further develop and build on. And just thank you for your work. The opportunity to join you today and we are happy to return at any point that you would like to give more information and have more discussion so thank you very much thank you agenda items 3.1 and 3.2 commissioner <laughs> Yeah, so uh, just kind of a, a little bit of the housekeeping kind of items. Um, uh, the, the consent agenda process is that uh, board members may ask to remove a, an item from the consent agenda. And my, my understanding that in a committee meeting yesterday, there's a desire to remove item 5.4.A for a separate conversation. So we'll move that to uh, the additional business as, as a routine and otherwise take up the consent agenda as, as proposed. Um, uh, one thing I just say on the agenda overall gives us a good chance to dialogue and discuss uh, all of the different topics that we have in front of the committees and thanks for your hard work on on those particular things as well um, uh, if there's I don't believe I have anything further on 3.1 item 3.2 I'll just turn to Ryan and see if there's any other board operations issues and he sh shaked his head, shook his head no so um, so that uh, president concludes my remarks thank you commissioner Item uh, four, President's Report. Um, we're a really busy group this last month and going to be busy next month as well. And so um, I'm going to uh, highlight some of those efforts. First of all, I'm really proud that um, in um, May, 
uh, the State Board will travel out to North Platte, Nebraska uh, to do a State Board meeting there. And in October, we will travel to Omaha to do a State Board um, meeting there. And that's part of our desire to uh, make things accessible to people who may not travel and for us to show uh, people in other cities that we're, we're thinking about them. Um, we have uh, some people going to NERCSA, which is the organization that represents uh, rural and urban schools. And uh, Robin and Patty and Kirk and Maureen um, will be traveling out there and I believe doing a listening session, uh, just listening to what people have to say to them. Um, the commissioner and I enjoyed speaking at the CTESO conference here in Lincoln. Um, and boy, you really find out what um, is happening in Nebraska with careers in technology when you talk to young people and they tell you what, you're do what they're doing um, across the state. And it is literally across the state. You might think that career in tech would only be in the rural, rural schools, but it's literally across the state. So we visited with them and um, they were here advocating for Nebraska um, to match funding with the Perkins grant so that uh, they would have even more opportunities. Um, I spent some time in the state capitol this last week uh, speaking to a group of about 70 uh, international thespian members and they were also advocating to their senators which I think this is really great. I see this expanding in our state where students are taking leadership um, as far as telling their uh, legislators what they think is important and what they think is good. Um, our staff uh, in the back is usually lined up back there. They're not right now, but uh, I always want to take a moment to thank them in the president's report because they make everything that we do easier. But. The best of all board for me was yesterday, uh, we're, we're doing some uh, uh, communication building and uh, training for the state board. And yesterday I think I really saw almost everybody uh, engaging almost all of the time. And since I, I have trouble once in a while going to another place, if you did go to another place, I didn't see it happening very often, okay? I saw a lot of cooperation uh, and listening and uh, communication happening between people that um, may, uh, may differ in opinion, so that's good. And I think what that shows is that we're all dedicated to what we're doing. And even though we don't have the same ideas on some issues, the truth is we have one thing in common, and that is that every person sitting on this board wants what they think is best for, for kids. And uh, yesterday I saw teachers teaching teachers. My board was teaching each other, and I was proud to stand back and watch. That ends my report. Uh, commissioner consent agenda. Yeah, and so just a reminder that we need a motion on the consent agenda um, and to remove 5.4.A as part of that motion. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Ma Maureen? I move to approve the consent agenda uh, with the absence of 5.4.A. Is there a second? Deborah, okay. All right. Can you show me where the consent agenda items are located on Spark? Are there anything there? I know, I see 5.1, Ryan. I'm good. Uh, per board policy, there is no discussion on the motion to approve the consent agenda. Andrea, please call the roll. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Penner? Yes. 
Goobles? Stevens? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Kojans? Yes. Seven yes, one absent. The motion passed. We will now have the standing committee reports. Item Agenda item 6.1, Vice Chair Robin Stevens will provide a report for the executive committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the executive committee had three basic areas of discussion. Uh, the commissioner's appraisal, uh, there was a dialogue held about that. Uh, policy dialogue, uh, which was also um, included in this meeting. And then the uh, last thing, which was uh, the legislative bills, and we will have a presentation at the correct time on that particular area. Please uh, allow me to read the report. The Commissioner's Appraisal Dialogue. Review questions for all the appraisal will cover the year 21-22. The review questions to be used will be the same as the instrument that was used in 2021. The board will receive the appraisal electronically on April 8th. The NDE staff will be available for a tutorial by request. Once sent to the board members, you will have two weeks to complete the online appraisal. In April, the executive committee will begin to discuss next year's appraisal process and contract. The results of this research and dialogue will be presented to the board at the May board meeting for dialogue and suggestions. In June, the board will vote on any changes to the commissioner's contract, goals, and the appraisal process that will be used for the following year. The process must be completed but prior to July 1 of 2022. In preparation for reviewing the document for the commissioner's appraisal for the 22-23 contract year, the executive committee reviewed the job description and the performance standards of education commissioners in Kansas and Colorado. Further research is underway with NASB to better understand the best practices in appraising a statewide education commission. The result of this research will also be used to formulate the next appraisal instrument. I do want to provide also in that uh, uh, Joel Sherling provided three very succinct things that we should all keep in mind. And I apologize if there is some redundancy here, but I, uh, Joel is obviously the person who, who takes care of uh, of the administration of this process. He stated, the board will be briefed on appraisal procedures at the April meeting. Board number two, the board members will receive an email with a link to the electronic appraisal on Friday, April 8th. You will have two weeks to complete it. The third thing, the board will discuss the results of the evaluation with the commissioner at the May business meeting. That's the first part. Let, let me, if I'm okay to continue on, obviously we'll ask for questions on all of these areas at the end of this report. Dialogue for, on policy. Prior to our committee changes, if you'll recall, we reduced from seven committees to four committees. The members of the former policy committee determined it was necessary to review bylaws, board operating policies, and the internal policy directives. There has been some overlap and confusion regarding these documents. Furthermore, the former policy commi committee found it necessary to define and review the process for developing board position statements. 
Patty Goobles, who uh, uh, has done a magnificent amount of work on this area, will give a presentation on these topics at the next board meeting, obviously then the April board meeting. Between now and the April board meeting, board members can review Patty's presentation in Spark. Okay. Until the changes are presented to the full board for approval, we will continue to make sure that we are reviewing and updating policies on the schedule and structure that is currently in place. Legislative bills and review of that dialogue and discussion. Today is, I think, the 39th day of the legislative session with approximately 20 days left for the discussion on the biennium budget and on plans for the AARPA funds. The Speaker of the Legislature has laid out his plans for the next two weeks and has made it clear that not all priority bills will be discussed this session. NDE staff has been working with the Education Committee on LB 1218, which I know is an area that we are all interested in, and it concerns the basic skills competencies, certification process of teachers. We are hopeful that this work will advance from the Education Committee. Obviously, the hope here is the concern of ed our teacher shortage, our educator shortage. The committee requests that Brian Halstead come to our meeting today to present a summary of where we are currently in this legislative session. This concludes my part of the executive committee report. The remainder is left to Brian. Thank you all, and uh, obviously there will be time for questions on the other areas as well, but we'll start with the legislative report. Thank you, Vice Chair. So everyone, Brian Halstead, Deputy Commissioner, as Mr. Stevens indicated, the legislature is about two-thirds of the way through its current session. They're scheduled to end mid-April. Um, this next week, they will start for the first time all day debate on matters that appear on their agenda. So this next week we are going to see the Appropriations Committee report the changes to the biennium budget. That's due by next Friday, the 40th legislative day. We also anticipate seeing how the legislature intends to spend the so-called billion dollars of additional American Rescue Plan aid that is available to the entire state of Nebraska. So there's a lot of anticipation coming this next week to see just exactly what's going to be coming out of all of the committees in that regard. In Spark, you have the status of the bills where you adopted to be proponents or opponents. All the hearings have been completed. So the next week or two, it's more of sorting through what has happened and what may happen for the legislature in March. So at that point, I'll stop. I'll field any questions that Mr. Stevens or other members uh, direct my way. I'll turn it back to the commissioner if he has any comments he'd like to make. Yeah, and thanks, Brian. I mean, one thing I will note, obviously, here with hearings over and other things, the executive committees, uh, you know, uh, like we used to have a legislative committee, now we have used the executive committee. I thank the executive committee for offering advice as we go through the session. It's very uh, helpful. I thank the board for being attentive to all the different issues that are uh, at hand. And, and I guess I really should especially thank Brian for his leadership in this space, who's had a couple years of experience on this. So uh, thanks, Brian. Are there any other questions or points of discussion from the board? I just. I just have Lisa. a question for Robin when the questions are done. So are, are you asking if we have any questions of Brian? Or are you asking if we have any questions about your committee? I'm, I'm, ask, I'm asking if you have any questions about the committee report from beginning to end. 
what I might ask just for Brian's sake is if you're if you're done with Brian for the moment, we can have him sit back down and he's not in the hot seat anyway. So. <laughs> Any questions? For Brian. For Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Okay, now that's um, clear. Okay, uh, Robin, in your report, um, you mentioned April 8th, and we would have two weeks to preview it and fill it out. Yet, we were told earlier that the report will be sent out March 8th electronically. Is can someone explain? Uh, I, I don't know if it was read that way, but the intention was that the, the, the instrument will go out April 8th, and it might have been said March. I didn't catch that, so it'd be... Oh, so it's going out the 8th, or April, 8th of April. April. Think, okay. Yeah, month confusion, perhaps. Okay. Just real quick, was that last month, or is that what I said? Um, you mentioned April 8th, and I think in committee and earlier sometime today somebody mentioned the electronic device or appraisal going out march 8th i think we keep saying the 8th and the intention is it's april 8th april 8th yeah. okay very good sorry for the confusion no worries <laughs> jeff robin in your report you mentioned that we would receive kind of a tutorial type of I don't know if you use the word tutorial, but I'm trying my best paraphrasing. Yes. Um, we get, get an idea of, of the instrument from, I believe it's probably our HR, our chief HR staff member. I know in April, we will not be doing the trainings or the board kind of retreat sessions. And so do you anticipate that that would happen in the same type of setting or that we'd have the same amount of time to devote to that instrument or have conversation or dialogue about it? We actually talked briefly on that and, and we haven't got a uh, good direction uh, from Joel or the commissioner at this particular time. Commissioner, do you have something you'd like to add to yeah, that? Yeah, if I can. Actually, what we've done typically, it's really just about the mechanics to make sure you understand the mechanics of how it works. And so what we've done in the past is uh, provide an opportunity where, where Joel Sherling can sit down with anybody that would like to do that. So we'll kind of create a space where you could do that individually. Um, he also will present at the full board meeting a, a broad overview of that process too. So you'll have a chance to look at it collectively too. Deborah. I just would like to add that uh, as we go through this process, we are going to have to, as Robin mentioned, uh, very quickly turn around our evaluation and plan and make decisions about uh, the commissioner's contract and evaluation process for the next contractual year. And so as you uh, answer the questions and go through those in that whole process. I know all of our committee members would be really interested in your input uh, so that we have that because uh, we're going to have to start discussing that in April and May. Thank you. Jacqueline. I may have some of these things, but I'm not sure. I'd have to go back through my email and the, the documents that I have, but just for your committee's kind of my thoughts. It would be really helpful for me if ahead of time prior to the meeting, the April 8th meeting, maybe sometime in the next week or so, I had a copy of the instrument, whether that be a PDF. I, prob I know I probably won't be able to go online, but to look at what the evaluation criteria is. And if I could also have a copy of the commissioner's contract that he's currently operating under, so that I can start to independently look at those things before we actually get to the instrument so that once I get there, I have kind of um, an idea of what I'm looking at. And the other thing I would kind of ask your committee to consider, and maybe the April board meeting is not the perfect place or timely, I'm not sure, I don't know. But if you could take back to your committee the idea of us as a board having a dialogue about the instrument that we use, 
as well as as we look at what we're I, I guess I just so that you understand where I'm coming from is if we go to sign a new contract in July I believe or June, June. so from now from March we have March April May three months once the contract is signed, we're doing that based on the evaluation criteria that we've created. And so going into that process, if the evaluation criteria that we currently have is not something that's working for everyone, and I have some indication that there were some ideas to change it based on some conversations we've had at the board and some changes that were proposed, um, then I think that we need an opportunity to have that discussion as a full board, and we have to get that done before June, before we sign a new contract. And so I just see us under a tighter time crunch, and I don't know if your committee agrees with me about that, but I do want an opportunity for the full board to discuss that together and not just coming as a recommendation from the committee. I see that as a role of the entire board, and so I ask your committee to give us that opportunity. I, I, I was just gonna ask the commissioner, maybe you were gonna respond to this. Uh, it's been asked uh, about having a copy of the instrument and, and uh, a copy of your current contract, and, and uh, Jacqueline just mentioned to herself, but it might not hurt for all of us to have that uh, th that would be my my belief. Yeah, and, and the committee is working on the idea of um, you know how to get through that time frame, and I think Robin was reporting on that. So in by the time we get to April, we're, we we kind of segment it. We have the current year we have to worry about in the future, and you're right, it's a tight tight time crunch to kind of make those things happen. So I I we definitely can get the current instrument, so everyone can be reviewing that current anything else that you need around that. I actually think it might lend itself well um, for a go through at the April meeting for that purpose. So folks, more about, again, about the instrument, what we've done, what we've done in the past. So we can expand, I think, a little bit what Joel was proposing to report on. So you can have a, di I'm gonna use dialogue, that's a word. Uh, you can have a dialogue about that. The intention is to bring back a product in May that would also align uh, with those conversations as it gets me thinking, and I, I don't mean to speak for the executive committee in, in this sense, but it does get me thinking that um, in the executive committee's work that it would make sense to do get that feedback from the other board members about the instrument, you know, from that that time frame between now and and uh, April and and then April and May. So I appreciate those 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 points. I think very well taken. Robin, yeah, just to follow up a little bit, uh, when I visited with Joel, I said, just give me three bullets. That is not <laughs> meant to be an all inclusive list. Uh, so just so you know, and uh, really the only person who probably needs the tutorial is yours truly from what I'm understanding. <laughs> so anyway. All right. Any more questions or discussion before we move on? Okay, thank you for the great discussion. Agenda. Agenda item 6.1B is the policy committee and it's already been stated that Patty Goobles is not here and we will wait for her to do her report on the work she's done. Okay, all right. Deborah, sorry, did you have a? So 6.1B, obviously Patty Google's not here, so she'll come and do the presentation next time, yep. All right, all right. Agenda item 6.2, Chair Maureen Nichols. Maureen Nichols, please provide a report from the Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Thank you, President Cojohns. The committee met yesterday afternoon the committee had one a consent agenda item that we dialogued, which was to authorize the commissioner to approve the use of up to $1,560,000 to fund grants to selected educational units for preschool through grade two support. 
Melody Hobson of the staff shared and covered the need for the support on early childhood grants, which would cover up to six ESUs. These grants are a result of stakeholder feedback identifying this as an area of need. These are seed grants to get the program and support system set up, which can be continued in future years depending on school district and ESU's desires to continue the new program. ESUs are being encouraged to work collaboratively on these grants and submit joint proposals. The committee was in consensus to pull and table this consent to agenda item until a plan with the remaining unobligated ARP ESSER funds is discussed in further detail with the committee. The committee had in-depth dialogue about the overall use of the remaining ESSER plan funding. The committee requested that NDE bring information back to the committee regarding how the need and use of the remaining funds is related to COVID, versus perhaps a previously existing need or a need that always was there, expectations of long-term impacts, and impacts on teacher recruitment, retention, and support. The committee had no action items to discuss. The monthly board travel expense report, um, NDE staff reviewed the report with us and noted total expenditures are still very low compared to years prior to the pandemic. There were no concerns on the report by committee members. The in-state travel authorization reports, there was no dialogue due to no concerns by committee members. This committee would like to spend some time learning how school finance works in Nebraska. Uh, and Bryce Wilson is gonna work with us this uh, in May when we meet out in North Platte to have this information shared with us. Uh, it's important for the committee itself to understand the ins and outs of uh, how school finance works. The committee would also like to review financial and budgeting policies. This concludes the budget and finance committee report. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, discussion. Um, I would like to ask the commissioner by um, postponing um, what you that consent agenda is there a timeline for funding having to be spent or will this harm getting things out to schools that they need in order to prepare how they're going to spend those funds specifically in their district um, I, and I wasn't privy, I wasn't in the committee conversation, but I, I think what I understand from the report was an interest of kind of knowing some more information about that um, before we would proceed forward. And I think staff have advised, um, um, you know, that there is some interest in moving forward as quickly as we can, but I, I think there's time to review that and let's make sure that we give you that proper time. Thank you. Could I, I'd like to add, Lisa, this money would be going to ESUs for the support, uh, and, and that would be working with districts and hoping that the impact that in working with districts uh, would uh, see improvement in the areas that the stakeholders showed the need for. So it's, I understood you to be saying that it was for districts and the money is going to ESUs, but there's the, connection I, piece yeah thank you for that clarification i just whichever it goes to i just wanted to make sure that it gets there in the timeline of the federal government uh, for expenditure any other discussion or questions <laughs> agenda item 6.3 Vice Chair Deborah Neary, please provide a report from the Planning and Evaluation Committee meeting. Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, my fellow committee members, uh, Robin Stevens and Kirk Penner. Uh, we had a two-hour discussion yesterday uh, that was extremely informative, and also all of the staff that were present, uh, we covered a lot of ground. 
uh, the planning and, and uh, evaluation, we, we discussed several items, one of which was Nebraska's college and career ready standards for mathematics, and I'll talk more about that at the end of the report, and we're gonna ask some uh, NDE team members to come up and, and give more information on those standards. Uh, but we also discussed um, an update regarding the proposed revisions uh, for Rule 10 and 14 uh, as a result of revised Nebraska statutes related to civics, character education, and financial literacy. And so the content is included uh, from these legislative bills. It's included in our educational standards. However, the statutes require that the NDE adopt this into our rules and regulations. And we will have more on that particular topic in the future, but just wanted you aware that uh, that is one of the things that our committee's working on. Uh, we also received an update on the Nebraska Student-Centered Assessment System, also known as NSCAS. Uh, this, the NDE staff provided an update on the NSCAS growth winter pilot and the plans for administering the NSCAS growth this spring. The committee discussed the concerns and challenges raised by local districts as a result of the NSCAS growth winter pilot. The NDE staff outlined plans for addressing the concerns, including more timely communication with districts. Map growth, which many of you are familiar with, uh, is, as we know, very well liked by our districts because it does show individual student progress and these are adaptive tests. And the NSCAS growth has been intentionally built with Nebraska's standards in mind and will meet state and federal testing requirements so the students will have fewer tests per year. Additionally, an assessment and accountability timeline and overview was also shared and as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted some of its summative assessments over the past two school years. This uh, has affected the ability to reclassify and redesignate schools as required by our state and federal accountability. As such, the NDE will pursue an ESSA state plan addendum from the U.S. Department of Education, which will provide the NDE flexibility to transition from the currently approved ESSA state plan to a revised plan that more accurately reflects the desired vision for assessment and accountability. So I'm gonna ask uh, several staff to come forward uh, and give a report on um, the, the most current work that the writing team has done. Uh, they will be discussing uh, draft one of the, uh, our, it's our future plans for draft one of the uh, mathematics standards. And I, like, I welcome Dr. Corey Epler, Dr. Marissa Pizant, and Deb Romanek. And did I pronounce that correctly? Okay, great. Uh, if you guys, uh, We'll begin, and I am going to ask you to, one of the things I really enjoyed from their report yesterday was learning about how they're incorporating the math standards work into workforce development needs and are working with, um, yeah, a lot of, um, anyway, future employers. And so if you'll touch on that, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, happy to be here to provide an update to the full board. We've been giving monthly updates to the committee uh, since October, and the last time we provided a full update to the board on the process to revise our current math standards was December. So thinking about December, January, February, here we are in March, and at the request of the committee last month, we wanted to provide a little bit of update as to where we're at in the process to revise our current standards. Um, I, I shared this back in December, and this is a, a piece of information that we continue to ground our conversations in uh, around the revision process. And I think it's important to note that we are currently revising the standards that were approved in 2015. And our charge in that work has been to revise the current standards and using those standards as a starting point. 
We also know that uh, the work with mathematics standards uh, is to outline grade level expectations for students uh, in mathematics. And that third bullet is really critical as we think about this work in, in ensuring that, when st that the standards, when mastered, allow students to be successful in post-secondary coursework without the need for remediation. So thinking about that uh, really seamless transition from 12th grade into post-secondary education mathematics and making sure that students are ready um, for that, uh, that coursework. Uh, we uh, hope and strive to develop standards that allow deep learning in mathematics and uh, as always in our standards process working to consider and incorporate stakeholder input and feedback as well. Um, I shared this also um, back in December but just as a reminder and I do want to note that this information is posted on the mathematics standards revision webpage. Uh, we do have a revision team that's comprised of, of, of at least 30 educators um, that represent public and non-public schools in our state. And we've organized them by grade band, thinking about their expertise. So um, individuals that uh, reflect K2, three, five, six, eight, and then our high school educators are organized by uh, topical strand, specifically those with expertise in data, geometry, and algebra. Um, and like I mentioned, their, their names, their school districts, and their roles uh, in their districts is posted on Spark as well. Um, since we last met in, uh, since we last provided a full board update in December, just to give you uh, an idea of some things that have happened in December, January, and February, also recognizing that December and January included holiday breaks for folks. Um, the real focus in December and January was on a connection to our post-secondary partners. So we hosted meetings with uh, representatives from the university system, so UNL, UNO, UNK, as well as UNMC, um, to really understand their expectations for students in mathematics. Um, we did the same in January with representatives from our state colleges. Um, we really have been trying to leverage our post-secondary partners as our subject matter experts in mathematics, in addition to the expertise of the educators that are a part of the revision team, but those who are also um, applied to be a part of the writing team as well. And the, the two questions that uh, we listed were really, the, the those were the two that we asked the post-secondary folks to weigh in on. Again, what types of knowledge do students need to know uh, to be successful in post-secondary mathematics? Uh, but to Deborah's point, that second question is uh, also thinking about what mathematics is needed for careers in Nebraska's growing industries. So as we think about um, the, the industries that continue to drive Nebraska's economy, we want to make sure that students also um, have mastered the mathematical skills that is required for them to be successful employees in those. And we'll talk about that in a, a little bit more depth in just a second as well. Um, so that was December and January, so primarily um, post-secondary engagement and continued work across the writing team. Um, and then in February, just a few weeks ago, the writing team met here in Lincoln, and really in that uh, time together was focusing on grade level alignment and progressions. Um, one of the, the things that's really important as we think about K-12 standards is ensuring that there's uh, a, logic, a, a, a clear learning progression from one grade level to the next. Um, and the example that's in the slides is thinking about, okay, when, we, when a student leaves kindergarten and goes into first grade, how do we ensure that the, the knowledge is connected and scaffolded appropriately? So that was really the focus of uh, that work uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we also, um, coming up later this month, just in March, is the team will meet in person at the Nebraska Association of Teachers of Mathematics Annual Conference uh, to continue to do some of that alignment work um, over the course of uh, the drafts. Um, we shared this with the committee last month and, and worked to really make sure that these are consistent as we think about uh, where we're at in March. Uh, so uh, as we don't have a draft available yet, uh, we wanted to identify some key considerations that are coming out of the revision. 
Um, and one of the things that we continue to hear from our educators and our school leaders is that there are a lot of standards. <laughs> um, and so what we've really worked with the, re the revision team is to identify um, the most essential mathematical concepts that would allow for a reduction in the number of standards without losing the, the information that they need to be successful uh, in mathematics across their K-12 uh, career. Uh, we also are really continuing to focus on uh, grades six, eight, and thinking about ratios and proportional reasoning, um, as well as arithmetic of rational numbers. Um, Deb gave a really great example yesterday. Do you, you want to like share that? One? Go for it. Let's talk math. <laughs> So I'm going to go all the way down to kindergarten. So one of our challenges is in National Review has been our organization. So our team is taking it very serious to look at what is emphasized in those big ideas. So in kindergarten, I can use the word counting, and that makes all sense to you. So right, you can count one, two, three. Well, guess what? It's counting in cardinality. So what that means is when I stop with three, that number represents the number of items I have in that row. So for kindergarten, that is like a key piece that they realize now they've stopped at three and they have three items, right? So those are the kind of pieces and discussions that our teachers are having. And if I can capture their discussions, they are priceless, right? Um, we'll have words on the page about what math standards should be, but all the discussions of these, everyone but everyone but ESU is represented in this team, it's awesome. So they are working very hard evenings and weekends to produce a draft for you for next month. Awesome, thanks Deb. Uh, if you ever want to do any math, feel free to join our committee. Um, <laughs> we've done math since October, literally. Um, but uh, that, that example, I think, continues to highlight how we're thinking about uh, the way math builds. Uh, the other piece is we've, uh, the writing team continues to think about what high school looks like in terms of the high school standards. Uh, right now they're grade banded, but thinking about a different structure that is more in line with how schools implement the standards. Um, and the last two bullets are really um, based on feedback from not only our educators and our post-secondary uh, 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 representatives, but also uh, the public, making sure that we're strengthening data across the K-12 stands, uh, standards, uh, not just in high school, but thinking about how starting in kindergarten data plays an important role um, and seeing that progress throughout uh, the K-12 uh, progression. And then the last one is thinking about the mathematical processes. So when we talk to employers, we hear a lot about problem solving and communication and those types of uh, uh, skills that are necessary. So uh, that's another piece that we're working to make sure are reflected in uh, the standards as well. I did just offer a, a very uh, kind of tentative high level timeline. Um, as uh, noted, we um, started this process last fall. Um, our target date to have a draft one available to the board and to the public is next month. We're still sorting out some of those details of what the timing of that might look like. Um, and then I also highlighted August, where we hope to have a draft to uh, the board and the public that would be, um, we would say, most close to the final draft that would be um, approved in September. Um, there's a lot of things that will happen in between there, including work with our post-secondary partners, uh, work with employers. Um, that's one thing that we did talk about yesterday in the committee is um, how we continue to engage employers in the conversation. Um, and that was something we intentionally did in the last revision was to understand the type of mathematics that uh, the workforce expects students to be able to uh, do. Um, and so that will happen across the summer as well. So um, yeah, I just offer that, you know, a few key updates. I, I will mention that the there is a running uh, monthly update that's more of a narrative. Um, that's posted in Spark every month, and it's also posted on our uh, standards webpage um, as well. All right, is there any question? Are there any questions or um, discussion on what these what they've offered so far? Jacqueline? So thank you for all of the work that you've done. <laughs> um, and for responding to our ad hoc committee requests in the middle of all of this. 
one of the things that I am passionate about or that I care about deeply are is math and math scores. And so one article we had from 2019 just reads verbatim, black students in Nebraska scored 31 points below white students in fourth grade math, 42 points below in eighth grade math, 31 in lower in both eighth and, or fourth and eighth grade reading. And so we know that there's a problem. And when I think about standards being developed, I guess we kind of think about the ideal trajectory. If a kid had what they needed and all things being even, this is how you would go through the process. I'm wondering, as we look at developing our new standards, knowing we have a problem what I might call a crisis, in my opinion, and that there's a huge portion of our population being disproportionately impacted. They are not following the trajectory of the current standards that we have. And so what has the current writing team or staff done to see where is the disconnect in moving between these phases for black and Hispanic children in our state how are we going to address this in a new standards process? Is it the standards that, or the transitions that's causing the problem? Or what have we done to figure out what it is that, that's causing it and seeing if, is this a place where it needs to be addressed or are there other places where we are addressing it? I didn't hear any of that here. And so if that's a part of the conversation, if you could illuminate me to it, if it's not, then we can talk about it offline. I just, I think we have a problem mm -hmm. and I wanna know what we're doing to talk about it. It's a perfect place to talk about it because um, like we admit to, uh, in the ad hoc committee work, thinking about standards being one part of the greater teaching and learning um, process, um, and one of the things that we've learned over the years with standards revision processes, in particular for ELA, mathematics, and science, is there wasn't consistency around how the standards were rolled out. I'm putting that in air quotes, rolled out. Um, and what happened is, is we have standards that are approved that the post-secondary systems recognize as meeting those expectations, but the, depart the, the department did not set forth clear plans around what actually implementation would look like. So that's one of the things we've really worked to clarify through all the standards revision process is once the standards are approved by the state board, what are the first steps districts should be taking to implement them? And then what is the consistent and any uh, statewide support that we can provide. The other thing I think part of the challenge also goes back to the connected pieces of standards, curriculum, instructional materials, and aligned assessments. So if we have standards that we're confident in, but when we look at the data around what instructional materials are being used and those are outdated or not high quality, then there's a disconnect. So part of what we're really trying to do is to continue to elevate the criteria for high quality instructional materials as part of supports for implementation. So I'll say yes, it didn't show up in here, but um, on the consent agenda was a contract with Rivet Education. Um, they built out our uh, resources for the implementation rollout of ELA. They're gonna do the same for mathematics. So we've already started that work with a steering team of ESU and Nebraska MTSS representatives and our team to think about before the standards are even developed, we're thinking about, okay, what should districts be doing once we get to September and October? So I, it, I also, I mean, this is a fun conversation for me, so we should definitely keep talking about it. But thinking about standards as one part of a greater system that needs additional support and attention. I might just add, it, it is an absolute important conversation for us. What we've done on instructional materials, you know, I think there's a lot of people's perspective that we pass, passed uh, English language arts standards, math standards, with the intention of also building assessment. We have that responsibility in those areas that, that are required. But we also know when we're providing that measurement, we see that and then see, see those gaps that are, that are persisting, right? And it's painful to watch those persist to me. 
And, um, but it does start to get you to dive in a little bit deeper. Okay, why is that happening? And so our, I really do think it's a great example of the, what's happened in early literacy and the work that we've done around with the, the legislature has been involved in them, the Reading Improvement Act, the intentional work that takes place in alignment of the standards and the instructional practices and the instructional materials. And so um, it is where we need to be talking about. And so I, I, I just see that and, and we have to continue to have those dialogues. And I think it's really, really important for this board to do that. Any more discussion, questions? Maureen? Um, this, this really isn't a question, but if I recall correctly from um, the last couple of years, uh, districts have taken note of seeing across the state where improvement has been seen in different curriculum areas. Uh, and they, and there's the website where they can go to see what um, curriculum company or what program they're using to, to see how they're, to see where that improvements have been made in that district. And uh, just from talking to some teachers in especially rural districts that have pressed that issue at the local level to say, let's look at districts like ours that have scores that aren't doing good and scores that have been raised to say, where do we need to go with our curriculum? They've changed their curriculum to the ones where they see the positive mm -hmm. uh, scores going up and it has made a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was exciting when I've been speaking with teachers the last couple of years to say, the information's on our website, utilize it talk to your district curriculum mm -hmm. or administrators. So I think that's important for all of us to know and understand and, and even take note of it ourselves when we're looking online to mm -hmm. see what districts are using high quality materials. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm glad to see you are so excited, Mr. <laughs> Edler. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're excited to see the final results and appreciated the kindergarten story. Um, all right, thank you so much. Agenda item 6.4, Chair Jacqueline Morrison, please provide a report from the Rules and Regulations Committee meeting. Okay. The Rules Committee met yesterday at 3.15 to review our committee meeting. We had a very short but mighty meeting. <laughs> uh, we, didn't, we did not have any action items on our agenda. A couple of the things that we were planning to discuss were not ready for discussion at the time. But one thing that we did discuss in detail was looking at policy B13, which is the policy that determines what the board's role and responsibility is in the rule and regulation process. We think that it would be good to update it. However, we have to get the permission and the direction from our president and the executive committee allowing us to review that. And so we think that might come through, but we are not directing another committee of what to do. Um, <laughs> so with that, with that policy, one of the things that had previously been implemented was that the commissioner has the discretion or authority to review the revision of the rules and regs before they go to, before they're published. And so one of the reasons my understanding from the past is why that was done was for efficiency because between the time that the board met and could vote on the revisions before they were published, you could get into three or four months before we could actually proceed. And so we think with the new committee structure that we have, we can make adjustments for that so that board members are able to see that before it goes and is published. And so we're gonna try to, or at least it's our hope, to build back in some board oversight of that of that process and we would do that through updating B13. We also talked about how we could incorporate as we 
talk more about transparency among the board and al allowing every all board members to know what's going on before things actually make it here, that preparation component. And so we, we discussed using Spark to notify other board members about when our agenda is up, when um, different drafts are available. And so as individual committee members, making it our responsibility to talk to other committee members and saying, I will be your voice in my committee. Let me know what your thoughts are so that we can make sure that you're represented. So that was the bulk of our, our conversation. We also just briefly discussed the legislation that's currently being, that's currently pending with the idea or at least the lens that changes to legislation now will affect rules and regulations in the future. And so knowing that the executive committee has their eye on that, but once the session is over, there's kind, there will kind of be a transition to what does that implementation look like in the rules and regs process. So we're kind of on hold until you guys do the handoff. So that's where we are right now. And I think we'll have a fuller uh, report at the next meeting. So that concludes my committee report. If anyone has any questions. Thank you, Jacqueline. So if there's any questions or discussion. I, I just want to add, there's a report on the current rules. And that used to be, we made a change to put it, I used to report on that um, as uh, part of the process underneath the commissioner. And I, Jacqueline, I didn't know if you wanted to report on that or just to draw their attention to that, that current status. Give me just a second. And I have it up if you don't. I'm going to delegate that right, to the thanks. commissioner. You can delegate it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of more used to doing that before, but I like this new idea, so this is good. Um, but there is a, a, a chapter 51, of which I think you approved, if, if I remember right, at the last meeting. It was approved by the Attorney General's office, um, so we'll go on to the governor, and Rule 51's around special education. And then also uh, we're wa awaiting a review then of another rule by the governor, which is uh, Rule 24. So that's on uh, certificate endorsements, a technical change we proposed before. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again, Jacqueline. Agenda item 7.1. Jacqueline, is there a motion on item 7.1? Yes. At this time, I move to adopt the recommendations of the Ad Hoc Committee on Content Area Standards. Is there a second? Okay, Lisa. The motion was made by Jacqueline Morrison and seconded by Lisa Fricke. Is there any discussion on this motion? Can you just give us a synopsis of that, please? Yes, give me just a second. Okay. I moved down my agenda looking for those reports for the commissioner now I'm didn't are you have what page is on it's just the hyperlink do you have it oh I'm on the okay I have it so I'm gonna just read through it if you want me to the executive can so the, in accordance with the recommendations in the committee report, we would ask, one, that the executive committee continue to review bylaw B2, the board committee to improve the makeup and operation of standing committees and recommend adoption of any revision to the board. Two, that the executive committee create a policy that defines the role of the board in the development and revision of content area standards and recommend adoption of the policy to the board. Three, that the planning and evaluation committee assume responsibility for guiding development, monitoring progress, and affirming revision of the NDE staff managed content areas development process. Four, the commissioner enlists the services of an external consultant to review and make recommendations to NDE staff to improve the content area standards development and revision processes. And five, 
the executive committee create a policy that directs the board to approve content area standards for all subject matter areas and recommend adoption of the policy to the board. Okay, so that reads that no matter what we provide the schools, any standards or any content that we're gonna write the standards, correct? Is that how you read that? The last one, number five? I'm, I'm not sure I ask, I, I'm not sure I'm following your question. Okay, so that, that, this ad hoc committee is requesting that we go back to the, it's the executive committee is going to do what with all standards in all content areas? The ad hoc committee would create a policy, so it's an action by, I'm sorry, that's not true. The executive committee would create a policy in line the way we have bylaws, policies. They would create a policy of the board that would say that the board, the state board being us, would approve content area standards for all subject matters. And that once the executive committee created a policy that stated that, they would bring that back to the full board and recommend adoption of that policy by this board. That is the action that we're asking them to take. Okay, so um, I mentioned this last, last meeting. I do oppose this and I will not be voting for it. Um, and I mentioned last time, it's kind of backdooring the health standards in my opinion. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're really just giving yourself power to write standards that you don't have given by law. Um, and so that's my first one. I have just several reasons for it. Um, so these are gonna go to the executive committee. They're gonna come back out. The board's gonna go 7-1. We're gonna write the standards. You're gonna go into which committee would handle those health standards? I'm just talking about the health standards right now. Which committee would write those? I'll ask you. Yeah, um, that would be the planning and evaluation committee, and that's also part of the recommendations within this. So okay, yes. okay. So that's going to go there, and they're going to write the, the health standards. That's what I'm going to concentrate on here. So as Robin talked about at our last meeting, he talked about compromise. And so I'm interested to see, as those go to that committee and come back on the compromise, let's see if those health standards come back with some compromises here. Let's see if they come back with the same topics that has cost this board the trust and credibility of the citizens of the state of Nebraska. If they do come out with those topics, you are green lighting and opening the door through your teaching of, this, of these topics that you really don't have the authority to write you're green lighting it to some of the same dangerous situations that recently passed with the fairness ordinance here in Lincoln. The door, since you're teaching these ideas, the door is gonna be literally open for grown men and boys who self-identify as females to use girls' locker rooms and bathrooms. Because you are teaching this, you are, you are going to put that. If you don't come back with the compromise that Mr. Stevens talks about, and just write some health standards, brush your teeth, comb your hair, um, that's where it's going to go. So I'm here. I'm the one voice here, and I'm here to protect our daughters, our sons, our granddaughters, and grandsons. Everyone in this room has one of those, most likely, and I'm going to protect them from sexual assault, being flashed, watched, intimidated in what should be a safe private environment. I'm also here, and this one is very dear to my heart, the route that you wanna go is gonna annihilate Title IX. Absolutely annihilate Title IX. My daughter, Allison, is a prime example, volleyball player from Little Town in Aurora, Nebraska. Due to Title IX, we, had, we needed to 
fund our women's sports in college and, and make it equal with the high school and the, and the colleges. She busted her butt. Full ride to University of North Carolina, Greensboro, four-year starter, blah, 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 $150,000 scholarship, free. Now we're watching men swim in the Ivy League. And I watched, I don't think it's just somewhere out there, I watched a, a guy play volleyball for Northern State University against Wayne State's women's volleyball team. This isn't something in the future. I'm trying to protect our women. And I have to say this today, and here's the driving point. I have to say this today because today I can say this without being fined for voicing my opinion. I might not be able to do this in the coming months in this town. Due to the fairness ordinance that was passed by the Lincoln City Council. I could probably talk about it outside and we could move our meetings outside, but I can't do it in this building if that does not get voted out. And here's the funny part. Not funny, sad. Who would have thought one year ago, 10 years ago, that protecting women, granddaughters, daughters, would be considered hate speech. And that's where we're at. It's very dear to my heart. So I ask, I ask you, Mr. Compromise, let's see what comes out of these health standards. Are we gonna brush your teeth? Or are we gonna teach people that you're get signed sex at birth and then you get to choose your gender? Let's see what those health standards are. Protect the girls, and that's all I've got. I, I would ask that you refrain from applauding so that, so that we can listen to the business that's being presented to us. Um, it's difficult when you inter interrupt Mr. Penner I really want to listen to everyone on my board, and I know you came here to do the same. So if you would be uh, so gracious as to do that, thank you. All right, Lisa. Um, thank you, Madam President, for saying that. Um, your passion is very evident, um, Kirk, and um, we all care about all children. Uh, there's so many important things in the, in the other bullets, and I believe those need to move forward. Um, the last bullet may need some tweaking to narrow the focus to what the committee intended. Um, and in the heart of negotiations, I have a question for you. If the last bullet were removed, would you be able to support the rest? I would not because I don't, I, my belief is we don't have the right to write those standards. That's my first point. We, the rest of them are dealing with Deborah. board committees. Okay. Go, ahead. Uh, Go ahead, please. Sir. I'm sorry. I was just going to say the other ones are dealing with bylaws and policy internal and then board bylaws to bind us and so there are other so i i'm done i'm just trying to negotiate something that will work to get so we have our working orders to move forward for what's best for everyone deborah yeah i want to first uh thank the ad hoc committee members because we all, during the whole last year of the process of the health standards, a lot of things came to our awareness uh, that we didn't have a written process. Uh, there was so many questions about the role of the board, et cetera. And we are now trying to fix and solve the challenges that we had. And I'm really proud and amazed with what's been accomplished by that ad hoc committee 
-hmm. and the recommendations. And there's still a lot more work to do, uh, but we at least have a vision. And I, I want to add that in my role on the State Board of Education, it's really important to me to, that we have clear information out to the public about what really falls under the work of our, our Department of Education and State Board of Education. And for that reason, I just want to ask you, Kirk, uh, I know you're new to the board, and so maybe, uh, I'm, I mean, I guess what I heard was discussion of quite a number of issues that have nothing to do with the scope of our work of the board, like Title IX and all those. That's and I wasn't sure if you understood that really all we're approving today is steps to look at and present a process that really isn't, I mean, and that's all. Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, You're adopting the steps to move to the executive committee that's going to approve writing all the standards for the content areas. That's the way I read that. And actually, what I talked about with Title IX, that has a lot to do because you're gonna teach these elementary kids, if it comes out without compromise, you're gonna teach these kids, it's gonna get worse. It's gonna get worse um, as you continue to push for gender, um, just, if, you know, it's just gonna get worse. And so it's a, it's a Title IX issue, it does. What you're doing here is a Title IX issue as well. And it has been fantastic for women, fantastic. Hundreds of thousands of women, hundreds of thousands. So I, I, think, it does, I think it does have merit and uh, that's what I'll say. Jacqueline. Um. I want to uh, respond to both Deborah and Kirk. Part of what we determined in the ad hoc committee was that the board had not definitively defined what its role in the process is. And that's number two, is that the executive committee would create a policy to define the role of the board in the development process. Some of the things that came out was what is the role of the board? And one of the things we know is to adopt standards. And I think the ones that you are specifically referring to are the ones that are enumerated in statute. But I've heard one of the things that it's you mentioned is that the board's going to write standards. And as we heard from this presentation that we just got about the math standards, Jacqueline Morrison isn't writing anything, and, and neither is Patsy Kojans. It would be written by a writing committee made up of teachers from throughout the state of Nebraska. And in our current packet, if you look through the agenda for today, I believe the writing committee of the math standards is in that packet, and it shows you which teachers make up that committee from throughout the state of Nebraska. And so they will not be written by this board, but what we are saying is they will be approved by this board. Any standards have to come before this board for our vote. That is what was missing and that's what we are trying to fix and trying to make sure where in that process do we want to review this? Where in this process does the commissioner have to bring this to us so that we can see it? Do we get it before the public gets it? Do we get it when the public gets it? Do we get it when superintendents get it? Do school districts get to see it before the general public does so that they can have comments on it? 
Those pieces weren't there. We think they need to be. I believe you may be on the planning and evaluation committee. I'm not sure. I'm not. But if you are, when it seems like when you were speaking to us, it's you, you, you. But I don't look at us that way. It's we. You're part of us now. And so you will have the opportunity to see them. You will have the opportunity to ask for compromise on that committee. And you will have the opportunity to have input. That's the way all of this works. And that's why I wrote, or not I, but that was some of the things that the committee considered was we were missing and we want to be included. But until we tell or give a directive to staff and the commissioner and say, here are the decision points where we want to be included, we haven't given any guidance and that's how we got to where we were. So that's why I think that they're necessary and why I would stand by them. And just to respond to Lisa, I wouldn't take any of them out. And if it came to the point where we were only voting on four or five, I'd say throw the whole thing away because they don't work unless you have them all together. That's my opinion. Can I just respond real quick? I mean, <laughs> we're 0 for 2 on the health standards. 0 for 2. And yes, I understand who's writing them. My point is we don't need to be writing them. And my point is you're going to write them. They're going to be written if this is approved because you want to do it. They want, we want to do it, right? I'm just one of seven. I'm speaking out. Okay? There's never been anybody in the last year when those health standards were written to come out on the other side, written by the teachers and so forth. But they had to be, you guys didn't say pull them back. And we don't have to go into this whole thing again. I understand your point. I understand your point. It still doesn't get down to, it, it doesn't get to the point I'm trying to make. Because I know that's where the, I believe that's where the board wants to go. Seven of you. Not me. That's my opinion. I don't want to go down the road where we're destroying and not protecting our granddaughters and daughters and sons. That's where I'm at. Somebody's got to say it. I just happen to be the guy. Robin. Yes, I, I just uh, stand in support of the comments that I heard uh, from Jacqueline. I uh, felt that she really summarized the issue. And uh, I, I just want to make sure that you understand that that, what I heard, was always the tone of the ad hoc committee. I, I know that, that there is this belief, and, and I, I, I can appreciate that as well, but I just want you to know that the things that I heard um, and, and eloquently stated uh, was always the uh, tone of the many meetings that were held by the ad hoc committee and then uh, expressed uh, extremely well in the, the report. Thank you, Robin. Deborah? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add again because I really want correct information to be out in the public. And I want to add that you know, go back to one of the facts that we learned recently is that Nebraska's one of only two states in the country that doesn't have health standards. And I really want your children and grandchildren to be competitive on a national stage, to have all the skills to be able to work with all different kinds of people and to be able to do that in a respectful way so that they will be successful nationally, et cetera. And I also want, I understand that you, that um, Kirk, just in response to what you said, I, I understand you uh, have very strong advocacy positions for your children and grandchildren. But as we talked about yesterday, we also have a moral imperative to be thinking about all of the children in our state and to understand, to really make an effort to understand the needs of all of the children 
in our schools across Nebraska. And there's a lot to that uh, that is being left out of the conversation when we're just talking about your children and grandchildren. <laughs> and that, thank you. I appreciated the explanation uh, Jacqueline gave. The ad hoc committee had tons of meetings to put this together for all of us to move forward as a team. And I can tell you, when I look at all of these, the impetus for me for the ad hoc committee was the process that failed. And this is the solution of hard work by board members to bring something to us so that that failed process doesn't happen again. And um, so I look at this as preventative medicine moving forward to have a process in place uh, so if something shouldn't come out of committee or um, doesn't come before the committee in a timely manner for us to read and study and research the document, that's a disservice. So the reason for this was to change some things that weren't working. So thank you, Jacqueline, Jacqueline for your explanation, being on that ad hoc committee that worked tremendously and long hours to come up with this plan. Just one more, one more, okay. I appreciate the hard work. I think it's slow plan and we're gonna get to the health standards and we'll see if there's compromise. And to Deborah's point, I will defend anybody's daughter and anybody's granddaughter in any bathroom, any bathroom, yours included, everybody. I will, t I will protect them all, and that's what this is about. I'm, I'm trying to protect women, and I'm not getting any support, but that's where I'm at. I'm done. Jacqueline. A lot of brave women and girls came to testify in front of us when we had the health standards discussions, lots. And a lot of women shared their stories. I had students email me privately about why they supported these standards. And where we are today on the standards, we could talk about that all day. But please, 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 do not insinuate that the women around this table do not stand up for girls and children. I personally, and I'm not, this isn't the place for this discussion, but what I do know is having worked in the criminal justice system in the way that you think or in some people's opinion, that protecting kids is them not knowing the names of their body parts. There are people in the criminal justice system who will tell you those same children, if they don't know the name, cannot have their prosecutors prosecute it because the kids can't explain what happened to them. And the reason I know is that I've worked in that system personally. And so with the same conviction that you wanna stand up and protect them, there are things that I too know that they need to be able to protect themselves and sometimes that's the name of what was violated. So I have always been an advocate for women and children. I, I would never insinuate that someone else wasn't something because they weren't doing it in the same way I did. I would just ask as board members that we, again, as we spoke about yesterday, assume everybody comes to something with good intentions and try to learn and understand why we're doing what we're doing because I guarantee we all have a reason or a history or a perspective that we bring.
seeing, seeing no more discussion and questions, um, is, uh, pardon me? No, okay, let's call the question, okay? Andrea, please call the roll. Mary? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Freaky? Yes. Nichols? Yes. <clears throat> Goobles? Morrison? Yes. Penner? No. Cojohns? Yes. Six yes, one no, one absent. Okay. We're going to go to public comment next, um, but before we do that, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, we've been sitting here a long time, so 10 minutes and then we'll report back here. One, public comment. We will now move to our public comment period and take up the remainder of our agenda after public comment. Agenda item 8.1. This period may be available to any person who wishes to address the State Board on any subject within its authority, including items appearing on the agenda, except for contested cases. Up to two hours will be allowed for public comment, comment the public comment period. A majority of members present and voting may take action to extend the uh, board members may take action to extend the total amount of time allowed for public comment, for the public comment period. A majority of members present and voting may also take action to allow or, or terminate public comment at any time during a meeting. Please note that the public comment should be on topics related to the State Board's constitutional and statutorial authority. Those wishing to speak must be signed in at the table outside of the meeting room. Persons speaking to the board during public comment should state their name at the beginning of their allotted time. Anyone refusing to be identified will be prohibited from speaking. Each person may address the board for up to four minute, five minutes, five minutes, uh, a majority of members present and voting may take action to reduce or extend the amount of individual time allotted to all speakers. If at any time persons appearing before the board exceed the time limit, time limit limitations uh, set forth in this policy on the agenda or become abusive or threatening in language or behavior, it shall be the responsibility of the president to declare that person out of order and to refuse permission to continue to address the board. Okay. We have, uh, we're ready to begin, I guess I'd say. Okay. Patsy? Yes. At this time, I would like to make a motion given the amount of speakers today and to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Also considering that we have another agenda item on the agenda where we're going to have to go into um, executive session. With all of that consideration, I'd move to reduce the amount of individual time to four minutes allotted for all speakers, giving each speaker an opportunity to speak. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Um, perhaps I missed it. Uh, could you clarify how many speakers we have today? Did I miss that? Tw 27 is the number. Okay. Thank you. Andrea, please call the roll. Penner? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Neary? Yes. Goobles? Morrison? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Cojohns? Yes. Seven yes, one absent. The names of the first 16 speakers. Oh, I keep doing that. 
Okay, the names of the first 16 speakers who will please, who will be called, please sit in the designated chairs at the front of the room. The first, the first 16, and uh, before I go through these names, my apologies if I mispronounce any. Bonnie Krebs, Jenna Durr, Kathy Adams, Anna Brocken, Cami Riley, Dory Bush, Liz Davids, Dr. Sue Greenwald, Greenwald, excuse me, Garen Hochstetler, Merlin Bartels, Sherry Jones, Laura Rice, Marnie Hodgins, S. Wayne Smith, Jean Greishen, and Amber Parger, and Bonnie, you will be first up. I am Bonnie Krebs from Neely, Nebraska. I have taught many years. I'm a retired educator of probably around 45 years. And I remember back not very long ago um, when we were, the teachers were asked to come up with the standards for education. We spent hours and hours and hours and hours writing standards. And then after we got them all done and tweaked, it was probably about Three years later, they decided, someone decided that the standards were going to be thrown out and new ones would be administered. So I know what standards are. Standards describe what students are expected to know and be able to do. I agree with Kirk Penner. I am here to stand to protect Nebraska Children Coalition. I feel that the new standards that have been proposed are not in, uh, I don't think that they're in with the alignment with the parents and guardians who are primary educators. I agree with Kirk. I think that the guardians and parents should be the first ones to decide for their children the local communities and schools are already teaching health and sex education. I think they do not need the state to direct how these should be taught at a local level. I think they should be taught at a local level and not decided by the Board of Education of the state of Nebraska. I propose a policy of local school boards with parent involvement in setting up and writing proposed health standards not those that were initially written and submitted by this Nebraska Board of Education. I believe in and support the legislative bill that is now in the legislature of 1158 that protects the children. Public schools shall facilitate parents and guardians access to information about involvement and in education practices. They should have access to schools learning materials, info, information about activities, digital materials, and so on. And I think that passing LB 1158 will prevent future problems that guardians and parents are currently having in learning about and battling against curricula, su uh, supplementary educational materials or programs. They contain CSE, CRT, or SEL. LB 1158 will align with the values of parents and guardians. LB 1158 will maximize local control by parents, guardians over their public and state local school districts. I also believe that Bill 768 should be passed to change provisions relating to comprehensive health education and repeal original sections. I think that the, the current health standards should be gotten rid of, that these are proposed. These standards teach transgender LGBT indoctrination to K2 students, consent to kindergartners, discuss hormone blockers, sex change hormones to fifth graders, offer health care providers for sixth graders and anal and oral sex instruction to limit STD transmissions in seventh grade. What totally immoral ideas. These are written by radical activists. As a former teacher, I think it looks like the future of education in America 
is getting worse. Let's get back to teaching kids how to become proficient in reading, writing, Thank and you, math. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Thank you. Ne next up, next up is Jenna Durr. I'm Jenna Durr from Kearney, and I'm here today on behalf of the Protect Nebraska Children Coalition. You already know where we stand on the radical health and sex education standards this board presented to the public last year. Last year, in the span of a few short months, tens of thousands of Nebraskans came together to speak with one clear voice, stop sexualizing our children and keep radical social agendas out of the classroom. What started as a ripple with a few concerned citizens grew into a tidal wave of public involvement focused on changing the conditions within our schools that have allowed the radicalization to occur for far too long. Nebraskans had fallen asleep, but now we are awake. And contrary to the supposed support we keep hearing about for the health and sex education standards, the Nebraska Department of Education's own research has proven that 90% of Nebraskans who participated in the survey were not in favor of the standards. And remember, Deb, we have seen your emails. Our coalition leadership and others have pushed for accountability and transparency. One such effort revealed the FOIA requested documents, which allowed all of us to understand how a select few on this board, outside of Mr. Penner, and in the NDE manipulated and lied about the process of developing the health and sex education standards. Rather than learning from the experiences of the last year, the NDE is now doubling down on its efforts to keep information hidden from public view. Recently, a member of our coalition leadership submitted a public records request for four search terms that may appear in department records. The terms were inclusive communities, racism, extremist, and professional development. The response from the NDE was a cost of nearly $10,000 due the, to the purportedly large number of offices, individuals, systems, devices, and document types involved, which would require more time than running a simple computer search involving only four terms. So the request was narrowed, and we resubmitted this. In order to make it a simple computer search, the requester asked only for emails, all of which are presumably housed on state servers. The department reviewed the request that was narrower and eventually responded that the privilege of electronically viewing the emails would now be $28,000. Wow. $28,000, really? $28,000 to search for four terms on email accounts stored on state servers and presumably immediately available for download. This board has had a crisis of confidence for nearly a year now. Transparency, trust, $28,000. $28,000 for ordinary citizens to review records to which they are entitled. Does that sound transparent? Is that what transparency looks like to all of you? The crisis of confidence continues. What are you hiding? Thank you, Jenna. Uh, Kathy Adams. My name is Kathy Adams, and I am from Kearney, Nebraska. At this point, I am feeling very, very angry. Um, this I did not have written down. But since Jacqueline brought up what she did, that little girls, little boys need to know exact terms. When I was seven years old, I was assaulted. We didn't have all these words when I was seven years old. But my parents and those that we talked to knew exactly what happened to me. When my daughter was assaulted, by her father. We didn't have all these terms, but the social workers and the police knew exactly what she was talking about, and we could point to where we had been hurt. I'm Jacqueline, I'm very disappointed. I had a student in YRTC that came to work for me in the canteen when I worked there. 
We were taking a break between stocking shelves and waiting on staff. I said to him, do you realize you are a leader? He did not see himself as being a leader and asked me why I thought he was one. I told him because others listen to you and they follow you. So even though you don't see yourself as a leader, you are one. The question is, is how are you going to lead? Are you going to lead in a way that will help them and lift them up? Or are you going to lead them down the wrong path in ways that will hurt them? My other grand, my granddaughter at 17 because of following other people is now mutilated and will never be able to have children. Let me be clear. Let me be clear. You are in leadership. And I ask you the same question as I ask my student. Are you going to lead in a way that will help others and lift them up, or are you going to lead them down the wrong path that will hurt them? One of you is leading in a way that will help others and lift them up. Seven of you are leading down the wrong path in ways that will hurt people. Again, let me be clear. Good leaders are not in a rush to do something. Good leaders look at the whole picture and take the time to think through and do what is best for all that is concerned and in responsible ways. Good leaders solve problems. Good leaders act with integrity. Good leaders know when to stand up or to stand down. Good leaders know when to speak and how to speak well. Bad leaders do none of these things and people get hurt. Thank you, Kirk, for having the strength to stand up for my granddaughters, my daughter, and my great-granddaughter. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. You all should be ashamed of yourself. Thank you, Kathy. Anna Brocken. Good morning, board members. My name is Anna Bracken. I live in Aurora, Nebraska, and I'm blessed to be the mother of two beautiful little girls. I never imagined I would find myself here today speaking out against these health education standards that most of you feel is appropriate and helpful content to expose young minds to. But I believe that God gives us opportunities to speak truth and to stand up for what is right. How quickly did God get removed from the public school system? And was it because a parent or two felt offended or outraged that their child would be hearing or exposed to something that wasn't in alignment with what they wanted to teach? Now, please help me understand how this situation is any different. You have had hundreds, thousands of parents voice strong opposition to this inappropriate content, yet you have not acted on it, except for Kirk. I would make a safe bet that all of these social or sexual or mental health issues began when God was removed from everything schools, families, public events. That is the source of what you think you're trying to fix. The ultimate friend, healer, comforter, and redeemer has been taken away, and now you're left with brokenness. The Bible teaches us to love our enemies and not to seek revenge. So with that, know that my family and I pray for each of you every day. And let me be clear also, you will continue to be in our prayers and rest assured, we parents will not be silenced, nor will we back down from defending biblical truths and defending our children whom God has entrusted us to protect. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Tammy Riley. My name is Cammie Riley, and I'm going to kind of follow up on what Kirk said, and I'm gonna show seven of you that seem to live in a bubble What's really happening? You are going to have things. I'm just going to read these. Um, headline, school using transition closets to hide children's trans transgender identity from parents. It seems every week another story emerges showing how progressives are hell-bent on sexualizing children. In this is instance, educators are using transition closets as a mean of helping students deal with their gender dysphoria to conceal the issue from their parents. The practice allows them to socially transition to the opposite sex without their parents' knowledge. 
The issue, can, the issue caused controversy when a Twitter account called Teachers Exposed posted a TikTok video in which an unnamed teacher explained how he helps students hide their identity from their parents. He said, the goal of the transition closet is for our students to wear the clothes that their parents approve of, come to school, and then swap out into the clothes that fit who they truly are. The transition closet, which features videos teaching girls how to bind their breasts so that they appear more masculine, recently received a grant from the Arkansas LGBT Plus Advancement Fund. The grant will be used to provide gender-affirming clothing and accessories for transgender and non-binary Arkansans. Another headline, parents fight back against activist teachers. One day, Jessica Conan, a mother of a young 12-year-old girl in middle school, was called in and told by the school that her daughter was now a boy. What she found out was that over the past several months, teachers indoctrinated her sixth grade daughter into believing she was trans transgender and bisexual. Her daughter didn't even know what those two words meant until these sick activist teachers infected her daughter with these twisted beliefs. The teachers recruited Jessica's daughter to join their equality club where she was told she may be transgender and bisexual. The teachers then helped her to create a totally new identity with new names, new pronouns, and had her use a different bathroom. They even created a gender support plan for her and instructed the faculty to use her new male name and pronouns, all without her mother's knowledge. And worse than that, these radical teachers told Jessica's daughter to not to tell her mom because she couldn't be trusted. They intentionally hid their radical indoctrination from Jessica, even though the Supreme Court has consistently ruled that parents have the right to control their children's education. It's disgusting, it's awful, and we have to stop it. The Center for American Liberty is suing the school and the teachers for their illegal actions. The lawsuit puts every single activist teacher, administrator, and school on notice. If you mess with our children, we will see you in court. A uh, side note to that story, it was after they called her in and told her about her daughter, COVID hit. She got to stay home, away from those teachers and away from that influence, and discovered she really did want to be a girl. <laughs> Last one is a story about a girl. The lies came swarming into Eve when she was just a young teen and she thought they would solve her problems. She was depressed and considering what she was battling, that was understandable. For years she'd been bullied, couldn't relate to other girls and found herself identifying more with males in the movies she watched. She heard the lie that becoming a male would fix everything and she bought it. When she was 15, she publicly identified as a boy and then she made the tragic choice. She started to change her body. She started taking testosterone and had her breasts surgically removed. Now a few years later, Eve is shattered. But as Eve laments, much of that damage can't be undone. She says, I can't stop thinking about how different my life could have been. I got the voice of a man I used Thank to you, love singing. Cammy, Dory Bush. Good morning. My name is Dory Bush. I returned to live in Lincoln a little over four years ago after living in Grand Island for 37 years where both of our sons attended Grand Island Public Schools before attending Grand Island Central Catholic for their high school years. Personally, I am a product of the Omaha Public School System. During my professional career, I taught the Junior Achievement Curriculum to third grade students at Dodge Elementary School in Grand Island. Following retirement from my professional work, I was a substitute teacher in our son's high school, so I do have actual classroom experience in both elementary and secondary classrooms. As a professional and a volunteer, the education and welfare of Nebraska's children has been a focus of my adult life, and I want to thank each board member for their concern and dedication to this important work. As my sons are now in their early 40s, it has been some time since they graduated from high school, but I've always tried to follow issues related to the education of young people as society is in desperate need of capable leadership for coming generations. For this reason, it has been quite distressing to me to the, that a vocal group of parents have disparaged the Nebraska State Board of Education as the board has endeavored to consider the ways by which we address the many issues facing all schools in these days of conflict in our state and in our country. 
calling for the resignation of any or all board members due to negative opinions on one or two issues is appalling to me. Our board members, without question, do their very best to represent the constituents that have elected them. The responsibility requires that each member spend many, many hours beyond the monthly board meetings and work sessions researching the issues brought to their attention. I unquestionably share the concern that our main responsibility to our young people is to provide them with the very best basic education possible and the life skills which will enable them to find meaningful work to support themselves and their future families in today's worlds. Surely, we can have differing opinions on how this occurs. But the bottom line is that we need to support and respect the board as a whole and to work with them to enable forward progress. No plan is perfect, and we need to contribute this, the, continue the conversation in a civil manner. I would certainly hope that all of us can agree on this and be respectful. Local support of our schools is definitely a critical piece of this equation and an area in which every individual can have the greatest impact. Let's allow the State Board of Education to pursue and complete the work which will provide the framework which allows this to happen. And I would add one, I have one minute left. So I needed to say that um, in sitting here thinking, I have two incredibly accomplished sons. One's a professor, one's working on his master's degree. Uh, they're incredible people. However, I was not a perfect parent. I'm the first one to admit it. And I don't think any of us are, no matter how our kids turn out. We do the best we can. Again, as a citizen of the state of Nebraska, I want to express my gratitude for each board member for your tireless efforts on behalf of the young people of Nebraska. Thank you, Dory. Liz Davids. So sorry. Thank you. Liz Davids from Lincoln. Since math was such a difficulty last month, I thought I would start out with the basics. 90%. 90% means 9 out of 10. That is 9 out of 10 Nebraskans who cared enough about the so-called health standards that this board proposed to them last year. 9 out of 10 Nebraskans who overcame their niceness, their natural niceness, and spoke up for their children and grandchildren. That 90% sent you written comments opposing those so-called health standards. 90% per UNL's reporting, not just our desire. So Ms. Neary, it doesn't matter how many people are, a, uh, are able to physically be at today's meeting or last month's meeting or every single meeting you've allowed us to be at since last April. 90% of written comments are opposed to the standards. And seemingly 99% of in-person comments are also opposed to those standards. It is not even close to being an evenly divided discussion. And if you know that so many people are passionate about their stance on the proponent side, then please, Ms. Neary, let them arrange to take time off of work and find childcare like many of us have to do every month and come to put their arguments before you and the rest of us. Maybe we'll be swayed by the pervasiveness of their arguments and put aside all our research, anecdotes, logic, and common sense. And maybe they have all day to spend with you since you delayed the public comment session, which is shameful. And now on to a language lesson. The definition of compromise is a settlement of differences in which each side makes concessions. Mr. Stevens, last month you said that we needed compromise when it comes to these health standards. You actually made a comparison with the Constitution, heaven help us, and we may need a history lesson at some point, but I have a question for you. What concession are you willing to make? I have a compromise suggestion for you. Take out the tiny part of these proposed standards that is based on political ideologies that confuse children about their identity and sexuality and keep the vast majority of the standards that are academic and scientific and healthy in content. Would we accept them then? Seems like the perfect compromise, since I'm guessing that 100% of the negative written comments are probably about the identity and sexuality issues that are already plaguing our children from cultural influences that we don't want you teaching at school. What do we want you teaching? We want you teaching that every single person is worthy of respect and no one should be bullied, ever for any reason. We don't have to agree on the personal choices that others make about their private lives. 
in order to respect them and treat them with kindness, that we can work together to achieve great things and make the world a better place, even as we think differently about some big issues. Teach them to get along without making them conform or pretend to support choices that go against their individual consciences. That is real life training right there. That would take care of Ms. Gubbel's desire to provide your constituents with a fine-tuned piece of machinery, wouldn't it? Take out the ill-fitting pieces and present Nebraskans with health standards we can all agree that present health, healthy scientific academic health standards we can be proud of. You can say all you want that you were for local control, Mr. Stevens, and public participation in our processes, Ms. Neary, but what you do is exactly the opposite. And now you are all on record for opposing local control and for opposing the removal of blatantly obscene and pornographic materials in our school libraries. You are on record for limiting the ability for the public to give oral comments in multiple meetings. Shame on you, even as you assured us that you wouldn't do that. So it doesn't matter what you say, we are keeping track of what you do. And for the record, Ms. Kojans, it is disrespectful to roll your eyes at us. You. you don't work on behalf of the public or the students or even the teachers at this point. You are a product of the system and we the people are taking it back. Thank you, Liz. Dr. Sue Greenwald. Hello, my name is Dr. Sue Greenwald. I'm a pediatrician and a grandmother and a mother. Uh, and I almost feel like a state board member. <laughs> it's been one year now since the neutron bomb of the health standards was dropped upon Nebraska. March 11th, 2021, we'll go down in history as the day that citizens were hit with the threat of a cultural tsunami in the form of CSE and CRT. A lot's happened to us in the last year, all of us. We've made a lot of new friends. We've become much more politically aware. I had a granddaughter. She's now nine months old. And I've actually visited you all more than I've visited her. And I'm sure you're sick of me too. As far as the health standards go, I see this as government overreach. In 2016, Omaha schools adopted health standards that included CSE. Their uh, curriculum is called Rights, Respect, and Responsibility, provided by uh, Advocates for Youth. They did not need you to do that. They did it all on their own. They seemed to be happy with it. Um, they implemented that because they had the freedom to do so. Last month, Kearney Public Schools, seeing what you all put out, decided to write their own health standards. They include a lot of good practical things. They do not include any CSE. They're happy with those standards. Everybody in the community is happy with those standards. They did that because they currently have the freedom to do that. They did not need your help to do those standards. Two school districts, two divergent priorities, but both districts are content with the results and did not need your help. This is what the words local control actually mean. You in this room presume that your priorities should be the priorities of the people in Scotts Bluff or Fairbury or Columbus or Kearney. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. When it comes to core subjects like math and science, probably we all have similar uh, thoughts and standards. And that's why it made sense when the legislature put together the State Board of Education and mandated for the board and the NDE to come up with standards for core subjects. When it comes to culture and politics, which includes CSE and CRT, every district is not OPS. Local control means that the local districts get to decide they don't get bullied. Bullying is something I think you're all against. All of you like to say the words local control. You say it all the time. We've seen all of you say it a million times. We know that one of you actually means it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Greenwald. Garen Hochstetler. Good morning. My name is Garen Hostetler and I'm from Lincoln. I'm here to ask this board to revive work toward the health education standards. 
These standards were written to protect children, and that's something needed now in every community across Nebraska. As an example from the standards, teaching kids about consent protects them from predators and harassers. For the youngest kids, they learn about safe and unsafe touch. As the grade levels go up, children learn refusal skills and how to persist in getting the attention of trusted adults about problems. They're taught that they are not to blame for abuse or harassment. This is knowledge that kids need to protect themselves and to alert adults to protect them. Health education programs similar to the proposed standards have been shown to produce safer outcomes for teens. According to an analysis of over 60,000 students in the February 2022 issue of Journal of Adolescent Health, students in health programs like this are significantly less likely to have ever had sex, less likely to be currently sexually active, less likely to have been forced to have sex, less likely to miss school because of safety concerns like bullying and less likely to use marijuana. If these are outcomes that we want, then we should adopt the health education standards. The main reason for opposition to these standards is that they acknowledge the existence of queer people. According to CDC and Gallup data, at least 10% of high school students and Gen Z adults are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Over 1% of Gen Z adults are transgender. These are conservative estimates. You can't protect Nebraska children without protecting the tens of thousands of Nebraska children and teens who will realize that they are queer by the time they reach high school, by the time they're in high school. You can't protect Nebraska children without protecting the several thousand transgender children and teens who are in Nebraska schools today. This is not a matter of urban and rural. Queer kids are in every community in Nebraska. We must protect queer children and teens even when it's unpopular with some adults. I know there are some adults in Nebraska who would rather have a dead kid than a queer kid. I've personally heard a Lincoln business owner announce to his staff, if one of my sons says he's gay, I will beat that F word half to death, and F word is not what he used. Let's not abuse children out of prejudice. Let's not avoid health education that protects all children because it's inclusive of queer children. If you want to be inclusive, but something's holding you back, there are so many learning resources available to satisfy your heart, your mind, and your soul. We know what works in schools. This board can make Nebraska a safer place for all children by establishing these standards and by restoring the earlier language that was removed in a failed attempt to appease adults who are committed to harming queer kids. You'll never have clear weather, but any day is a good day to do the right thing. The protection of all Nebraska children can't wait. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Garen. Merlin O. Bartels. Good morning. My name's Merlin Bartels from Upland, Nebraska. I'm here this morning to tell you to scrap the standards of CSE, especially the sex standards of it. My question for you is, did you read the comments were submitted to the department's website for this meeting? I went through them last night. There were 373 of them was what I saw, and they were from across the state. And I didn't see any that said, we are for these, go ahead and put them in place. I read one from a mental health therapist that said these standards are inappropriate information for the mental health of the children, especially the younger ages. Last meeting, Ms. Neary said that she has received emails, texts, calls, and other comments from people supporting these standards. If these people support these standards, why don't they submit them to the state's comment line so we can all see them and they can be heard? I didn't see any there. You as a board have wasted at least six months on something that the state survey showed that 90% were against these standards. Scrap them and move on to issues at hand. Low proficiency test scores, loss of teachers. Let's educate our kids and raise the bar for the testing instead of just getting by. Teach the everyday skills of life, like managing money, setting budgets, how to pick a career that will be fulfilling as well as contributing to the good society and get along with all groups of people. 
After last month's meeting, I heard that a statement was made that Kirk Penner's fan club was here. He did not create this fan club. You as a board did. And it's not a fan club, but a group of concerned Nebraskans that want the best for our kids and you as a board to do what people are asking you to do. Scrap these standards and move on. Even you admitted this morning that our Miss Morrison said we're in trouble with math standards and stuff in our classes. So let's move on and educate the kids where we need to be educating them. Put it back to the local school administration, the school board's parent input to deal with the health sex standards as it has been in the past and it's worked so far. And we've just had two examples of bigger schools that have done that and seem to be pleased with it. So put it back to the local control. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Merlin. Sherry Jones. Thank you. I'm Sherry Jones from Grand Island, a candidate for State Board of Education for District 6. Last month, I shared my concerns of teaching fifth grade students about the potential role of hormone blockers, which have grave and numerous health risks. Today, I want to talk about comprehensive sex education, often referred to as CSE. Upon adoption of standards, regardless of the subject matter, schools purchase materials to teach to the standards. In order to meet the requirements of the State Board of Education's proposed human growth and development standards, schools would need to purchase what is called comprehensive sex education curriculum. For those of you who are not familiar with what CSE curriculum is like, I will share the content of one particular lesson from a curriculum entitled Rights, Respect, and Responsibility, a K through 12 curriculum which the Omaha Public Schools began using in either 2015 or 16. It is published by the organization Advocates for Youth. Don't be, dis don't be misled by these respectable sounding titles. In one of the lessons, the students are encouraged to view porn. Yes, to view pornography. Following are the exact words from the lesson, and I quote, is it normal to watch porn? Yes, it's normal. Lots of people watch porn. After all, it's right there, and it's free. And that was how they accentuated the words. End of quote. And no, I did not watch the entire lesson. Those 22 words were more than enough to inform me of the despicable content. People with a sense of reason no pornography is devastating in so many ways and should not be encouraged for viewing by anyone, let alone our children. Following are just a few of the effects of viewing pornography. Creates emotional bond with artificial world. A person can actually lose the ability to bond with real people. Triggers addiction cycle in brain. Pornography ad addicts will need to engage in the same difficult recovery process a drug addict has to go through. It is unsatisfying, eventually resulting in feelings of emptiness, low self-esteem, and deep loneliness. It ultimately creates emotional distance in relationships, and pornography perp perpetuates the commercial sexual exploitation of women and children in America. So I ask, why would we encourage teenagers to view pornography? What is the purpose in doing so? I cannot think of one redeeming quality of pornography. I view these human growth and development standards and comprehensive sex education curriculum as a package deal, an unacceptable duo. As you've heard many times within the past 12 months, please let these standards go and move on to other essential matters. If local districts want to develop their own health standards, they can do so, as Kearney Public School has recently done. Nebraska school districts are capable of developing their own with their specific community standards in mind. In closing, I believe the State Board of Education should be protecting our students' hearts, minds, and bodies. And that includes keeping CSE out of our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sherry. Laura Rice. Don't start my time just yet, but do you have this picture? 
Thank you. Okay, my name is Laura Rice and I live in rural Nebraska and this is my family. I have two children, their spouses, and seven beautiful and very intelligent grandchildren. I love them and I'm proud of their goals and their achievements. They work hard and they play hard. They attend church and they know who created them. We have taught them our family values and encouraged them to think for themselves. We are raising them to be leaders. Traits, both good and bad, are taught and learned in the home. A home and a family is the place where they come when they make a mistake and they're welcomed back with open arms. It's the parents' responsibility to teach their children what they need to know about dealing with life. Now take that picture that I gave you and tear it in half. Go on. Tear it. Do it again. Tear it again. <laughs> Excuse me. That is what you are doing to my family with CRT and CSE. That hurts me. <clears throat> you are creating sexual confusion. You, not our children, you. Ask any preschool child, and I've worked in a preschool so I know, if they are a boy or a girl and they can tell you. It's only when they go to school that they start doubting that. Why is that? You are creating that problem. You are resurrecting racial tensions that have been all but eliminated until you push CRT. What do you think CRT will do to my family when they come home from school and they ask, is my mommy an oppressor? Is my daddy oppressed? You are creating that problem. You are attempting to undo Martin Luther King's work when he said that he hoped his four children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. In America, any person can achieve their dreams if they work hard enough. If America is truly racist, why are so many people coming here? It just doesn't make sense. We are not a racist country. Your job is to educate Nebraska's children in reading, writing, math, and science, skills necessary to have a successful career. Why do so many of Nebraska's high school seniors graduate with minimal reading and writing and math scores? Jackie, you said that yourself. There's a big gap there. That's what you should be focusing on, the true core pillars of education. So in conclusion, I wanted to read this little quote for you to think about as you move forward. Whoever caused one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Matthew 18, 6. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Marnie Hodgkin. Hi, my name is Marnie Hodgkin. I'm from Omaha. I want to share a little backstory. Two years ago, my older boys were enrolled at a Montessori school we loved. Then COVID happened, and like every family that spring, our normal was turned upside down. We got through the crazy of pandemic homeschooling, and that summer, the school informed us of their new policies. Plexiglass, social distancing, masks, parents couldn't come into the building, no parent volunteers, and reporting travel to the office in the event of potential contact. Didn't sit well with me or my husband. I made the decision to do what aligned best with our views. I brought them home and have been teaching them the past two years. I share that because I want you to know I'm the kind of mom who stands by principles and takes matters into my own hands when the rest of the world doesn't agree. That summer, the number of homeschooling families increased in Nebraska by 21%. 
I'm not alone in how I feel about COVID policies, and as you've witnessed this past year, I'm not alone in how I feel about these health standards. Parents will consider other schooling alternatives if the standards go through. My concern lies with the families who don't have means or resources and feel they have to compromise their values for an education their kids are entitled to. Quick airing of grievances aside from our health standards for a bit. Uh, you moved public comment to the end, which I think is uh, just another attempt to deter and discourage um, for a board who prides themselves on being inclusive. This is deliberately exclusionary, and now people who can't get here already with the public comment being at the meeting, is, is their chance is probably slim to none now. So, anyway. I recently found out the board is spending 37,500 of our tax-paying dollars for a consulting firm. Prism Advisors was hired so you can all learn how to get along. Sure. <laughs> $37,500 is just a drop in the bucket when the state board has a budget of a billion dollars, but to me, it is fiscally irrelevant and irresponsible. That money should be used to improve education instead of your interpersonal board member relationships. Last month, we witnessed a sorry seven to one vote opposing Kirk Penner's motion to permanently reject the health standards. You keep saying you support local control and parental involvement, yet you voted against it. Patsy, Lisa, Jacqueline, Deb, Mor Robin, Maureen, and Patty, you all drew your lines in wet cement on February 4th. I sat through the remainder of the meeting disappointed and then stunned when Jacqueline defended the sexually explicit material Kirk read. She asked if he was concerned with the content or was he concerned that some of these books had LGBTQ plus themes. The books he read had both characters representing both sides. Literary porn is literary porn. The point is it's all smut and none of it belongs in our schools. Jacqueline's big issue for supporting the health standards is the mental health component. Jacqueline, have you thought much about how sexually laden curriculum will affect the mental health of our children? Please, research neuroplasticity and the effects of pornography. I have resources if you need them. So, on February 4th, as I watched the lines in the wet cement dry, I made a final decision on something I've been praying on for months. I drove straight from the meeting to the Douglas County Election, Election Commission and got my paperwork. Today, I'm announcing my candidacy for State Board of Education, District 8, because I am done fighting from the outside in. Thank you, board, for motivating a mom like me to take it one step further. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to get elected, and I'm going to fight for our Nebraska kids from the inside out. <laughs> Folks, I'm putting myself out here for the kids. I'll be a face for District 8, but I do need your help. I'll have volunteer contact information and sign-up sheets in the back. Come see me, please. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie. S. Wayne Smith. Good morning. My name is Wayne Smith. I'm with the Nebraska for Founders Values. Since I left the last meeting, I've been trying to understand why the board didn't go along with Kirk Penner's recommendation to stop working on the health standards. The only thing I can come up with is pride. Sometimes people get so dug in on something that their pride won't let them change. That is what I think is happening with the health standards. Ask yourselves if your pride has made you inflexible. My recommendation is that you forget your pride and go along with Kirk Penner's proposal to scrap the health standards. Kirk will be on the right side of history in the long run. Kirk, keep the pressure on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Jeannie Grison. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeannie Grice and I'm from Lincoln. And today I want to thank the members of this board. I want to thank you for putting your true agenda on display for all to see with your vote against scrapping the health standards. Everyone voted against it except Kurt Penner. Um, you saved a lot of folks time and energy researching um, and have taken out the guesswork on where you really stand with your agenda. I want to thank you for showing everyone that your agenda is your personal agenda, 
that is more important than the well-being of children. I want to thank you for making it known that you don't want parents' input um, in your actions on trying to silence everybody that comes to this board meeting and moving the time and cutting our time. Um, I want to thank you for displaying your true love of pornography when a few excerpts of pornography isn't enough um, to curb your appetite for it, but instead you want the entire book. I want to thank you for showing the importance of mathematics in the real world. Being able to do math in your head and convert minutes to hours is a lifelong skill. I want to thank you for going on the record and showing that this board cannot be trusted with our children and their well-being. I want to thank you for putting on display your egos versus the good of humanity. The display of your ego is why this, these board meetings are the most dysfunctional. And lastly, I want to thank you for showing Nebraskans over the past months that the education system needs an overhaul. This board needs an overhaul. And the best educators for our children our parents. And because I have two minutes left, I want to thank Kurt Penner for calling out the smoke and mirrors that was going on this morning. So after last meeting, when it was brought up the failing education system in math, English, reading, science, and the standardized tests, that these kids are failing and getting 50% or less, the talk was about math and the failures. And funny, we have a math uh, uh, seminar going on today, how we can improve mathematics for a way to back end in your health standards. And Kurt saw it, and thank you, Kurt, for calling out the smoke and mirrors that tried to happen at this board meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Amber Parker. Wow, great disappointment. Um, I made a Facebook Live video uh, to show the votes, the transparency, but this goes beyond transparency. We need to tear up political speech because this is children's innocence. Deborah Neary, I've read through your emails through the FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, and now I hear it's $28,000 for certain words to obtain certain records. $28,000 you're going to charge the citizens, the parents? This is a nanny state mentality. Kirk Pinner, thank you for standing up. Consent. There's a problem when you're pushing a foundation to teach children sexual touch or actions are OK as long as they, the children, give each other consent. Deborah Neary, Maureen Nichols, Robin Stevens, Patsy Cojohns, Lisa Fricky, Jacqueline Morrison. Jacqueline, I could not believe I heard an excuse that it was okay if um, hardcore pornography, but a zeroing on, in on LGBTQ. These are children. And then the rest of you to support it and say local control is okay for schools in their local school districts to choose hardcore pornography. Shame on you, it's not okay. To the officers in our law enforcement, we need to arrest those who are going to prey upon our children. My heart grieves. Then you set up this ad hoc committee to give yourselves more power, power that was never offered to any of you. But you stole it. And in this ad hoc committee, you are pushing further than before the comprehensive sex education agenda. We see it. What all seven of you have supported, teaching children to have sex with other children under the guise of health standards, and you tried to hide it. Thank you, Amber. Uh, it, it is now time for the remainder of the um, uh, participants to come forward. Brenda McGill, Derek Jones, Carol Watson, Deborah Oliver, Stephanie Johnson, Jennifer Hicks, Lee Todd, Mark Bunkowitz, Gwen Easter, Christina Campbell, and Deb Fishbeck. And as soon as you get up here, Brenda, you will be first up.
Hello, Brenda McGill from Lincoln, and I want to first start off with thanking Mr. Kirk Penner for everything he has done and will continue to do. And as far as the rest of you, I want to speak about the subject of consent. This is really all about consent. You say you want to teach comprehensive sex curriculum to our students, to our children. Well, I do know this, they need to be taught about consent, what it is and what it is not. And the fact that minors cannot consent. Minors cannot consent to sexual activity. I know that when you include in your curriculum questions, scenarios for the children to consider, scenarios where a child is with another child, a peer, and they start talking sexually with each other, and it's presented to them, what would you do? How would this make you feel? What would you do in this situation? What if it was a different peer member? What if it was this situation or that? All these highly sexualized, highly charged scenarios you're presenting to our children. In a school environment, it puts in their mind this idea that they can consent when that's not a fact. Developmentally, scientifically speaking, if you care about science and things like facts, they cannot consent. Now, the, the question presented to, to the children is what would you do, what would you say? Well, there's a problem with this. It isn't their answer that's important, it is the fact that this question should not be presented at all. This question should not be presented to a minor from anyone. They cannot answer, do you, do you see? You cannot teach the children these things. They cannot think clearly for themselves enough to recognize these very complicated manners. That's why they are children. They need us. They need parental involvement and guidance. They need protection. We cannot allow this indoctrination to take a hold of their, in their minds and present this confusion. They need to clearly understand they cannot consent when they are minors. Just because with other, with other minors, that does not make it okay. The Romeo and Juliet laws are meant to protect young teenagers who are in love and make poor choices, regretful choices. It's not meant to say anything goes when you are a child. Be as sexualized as you want. That's not the message we want to send. Us, the parents, the community members, we do not consent to this highly sexualized content in our schools. We do not consent, and you well listen to us. You continue to take your stance you are. You are teaching the children exactly the kind of thing we don't want them to be around, someone who will not take their no for an answer. You are demonstrating to them what we will not tolerate. You must accept are no, you're wanting to invoke lawlessness in our community. It, this whole agenda, there's something behind all of this. It's not just here in Lincoln, you're not just misguided people, this is happening everywhere. This is a spirit of lawlessness. The last influence of God in our community is in the laws and you want us to take away the age of consent. You wanna take it away and involve children in all sexual matters and take law out of it. And law is what keeps us from letting feelings and emotions guide us. Law and facts and consequences. And that's what we must stand on, principles. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Derek Jones. Good morning, I'm Derek Jones. I'm a resident of Bennett, Nebraska. This comment concerns the current debate to remove certain books from public school libraries in fact, I found one of those books at my local school's library. In one chapter, a character massacres a nearby village. The purpose was to marry the daughter of his village chief. To prove that he defeated them, he brought four skins of dead men, hundreds of them. In another chapter, a father is confronted as a stranger to a village. After being confronted with violence, the father offers his daughters for the community to gang rape. After being chased away from the village, the father and his daughter seek shelter in a cave. The next scenes describe how the daughter seduce their father so they may have sexual intercourse with him. Finally, in another chapter, word for word, Amon said to Tamar, 
Bring the food into the chamber so that I may eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes she made and brought them into the chamber to her brother. When she brought them near to eat, he took a hold of her. Come lie with me, sister, she answered. No, my brother, don't violate me for such a thing is not done. As for me, where could I hide my shame? He would not listen to her, and being stronger than her, he violated and lied with her. A scene with incestuous incestuous rape at the fingertips of Nebraska children. How can a book with scenes of incest, violent rapes, and wanton massacres of millions be available to our children? As some, of you may, as, as some of you have may have come to realize, this book is the Christian Bible. Let it be known that I don't advocate for the Bible's removal from public school libraries. My point is that this demand to remove literature that has depictions of non-heterosexual depictions become stale when you acknowledge that those advocating for such removal are entirely content that one such book lies within arm's reach of their children every Sunday in their pews. Presently, there are multitudes of books in Nebraska public school libraries that have depictions of heterosexual intimacy in individuals, including renowned classics such as To Kill a Mockingbird and The Great Gatsby. By isolating non-heterosexual depictions, as the standard to remove books from public school libraries, we are implicitly giving our children a pass to bully, harass, and even assault those who they perceive as different. Brandon Tina resided in Humboldt, Nebraska. In 1993, he was raped and murdered after being forced to show his genitals. Those who tortured him didn't like what they saw, and they took, thus they took his life. The story was told in the movie Boys Don't Cry. This is how others perceive Nebraska and how it treats those in the LGBTQA community. Times are changing. I hear from our state leaders the concern that talented and intelligent young persons who call Nebraska home are leaving to live elsewhere. I'm here to tell you that this trend will continue as long as the environment within the state, as reinforced by those with power, continues to treat LGBTQA individuals as anything other than human. To the members of the board, the future of Nebraska, you guys have the power to change it. Us young Nebraskans develop friendships and family with members of the LGBTQA community when we attain education and employment outside of our hometowns. We will not keep our talents and intelligence in the state when you take government action to ensure that they are miserable. You can make Nebraska a home where my peers can, in the words of our founders, pursue happiness or you can prove to non-Nebraskans that they are who they thought they were, we were. A state stuck in the 1980s, more concerned about the genitalia of its res residents than humanity that we all are. Thank you, Derek. Carol Watson. Good afternoon, <clears throat> um, state school board members. I'm Carol Watson. I come from Arnold, Nebraska. My conversation to you today is a topic that uh, Anna talked on a little bit earlier, but mine's about history of the United States of America. Nothing has been said today much about history. I would uh, submit to you that no issue looms larger in the minds of Nebraska parents than the failure of the American educational system. I'm here today to testify to that fact at this meeting. America had its humble beginnings in a ship called the Mayflower, November 11th, 1620, Cape Cod, whereupon the self-governing Christians known as pilgrims were gazing upon a wilderness in the dead of winter and having been persecuted in England and for their religious beliefs, then spent 12 years in exile in Holland, but now they've arrived in New England for their religious beliefs. Well, why did they come? The first great constitutional document of America answers that question. Do you know what that was? The Mayflower Compact. That states the reason was to build a colony for the glory of God. So let's define what covenant is and what it means, since we don't use that term much today. A covenant is a solemn agreement, a sacred promise, signed or not, between God and an individual or individuals, a church or a nation. Yes, our founding fathers were biblicists, understood the enormity of their act, and they were aware that God would inevitably act in accordance with his word if any of the covenanters would obey his word. Deuteronomy 7, 9 states that God will keep his covenant 
even to a thousand generations. The truth of blessing was just as true for a state as for individuals. Marshall Foster in the book, American Covenant, The Untold Story, talks a little bit about history. For several generations, we have assumed that American experience is just the chance accumulation of adventurers, deists, and religious outcasts who came here seeking their own economic gain and stumbled into assured prosperity because of abundant natural resources. Those are distortions in varying degrees put in our history textbooks, films, and even media platform. Let us fast forward then 150 years from the Mayflower Compact. Was education important in the early, to the early colonists? Were they interested in teaching history to their children? History tells us that early education in the colonies was very unique. Even uh, private education was the norm in home and churches and schools with the Bible as the foundation for character development as well as intellectual insight. The pilgrims and other colonists were greatly interested in education, but they saw it as a personal family and church responsibility, always under parental control and always biblically based, Marshall Foster said. And I would submit to you, this fact was, not 70% were um, literate, but 100%. We cannot say that today, can we? Horace Mann, 1838, changed things. Then we became a progressive public school movement. And I want to end this with saying, I stand against this progressive movement that he started. I would ask all of you to join me in not losing our future by failing to come to grips with our past. Thank you. Thank you much, Carol. Deborah Oliver. Okay, moving on. Stephanie Johnson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Johnson, and I am here on behalf of Nebraska's for Founders Values, and I'm a retired speech pathologist from Lincoln Public Schools, where I served for 15, 16 years, um, six children and a grandson. And I do represent 90%, the 90% um, that you received as far as who is standing up against these standards. Um, I'm just getting a sense that many of you feel, as these testimonies are going through, there's, that it's what is being portrayed as an impact of these standards isn't necessarily as bad as what people are saying. And it, I, we, it's the posturing, and, and one of the things, Patsy, when, when we were clapping and you said, I want to be able to hear my board, with all due respect, it's our board. It's, it's not your board. You, you represent us. You're our board. And this is a, what I witnessed this morning was the, what, you, what you were doing in sense is you created a problem last March by, you created your own problem by introducing these standards. No one asked for these standards. As a matter of fact, you see 90% of people are against, uh, against them. It's your own personal wills to keep this going, and you created the problem. And today, so you had a problem. You needed to put a policy on paper. You have to put this in writing now that you can move forward with these standards. So you created a solution to your own problem that we didn't ask for, that we've been coming and standing in front of you for months now telling you that we don't want. And yes, I have seen women, young women come and testify, young men as well. But what I've witnessed in that regard is I have seen, I did not know that it worked like this, that they would come in buses, they would come in vans, they would come in cars, very well organized as a representation of the LGBTQ community. Whereas I would just wish we were that organized <laughs> to go bring it, Jacqueline, you don't have to make a face. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is exactly what I'm talking about. If you think I'm lying, I'm not lying. 
They, I had no clue. I'm like, why are they budding in line? Why is there an adult buddy waiting for them, getting them signed in, and they all wait? And there's like 25 of them. And that's not a representation of the entire population. There are 300,000 children in Nebraska, and they would bus in 25 of them to represent this, these standards that you want to move forward so that you can sit and say, people have, we've seen these women. I was in shock that it worked that way. This is a very big deal. People, do we don't want this. Nobody asked for this. You chose to continue it last month with a vote, to continue it going. Why? You put it on a shelf hoping we'll forget about it. We're not going to forget about this. We will not forget about this. Th this is our future. These, we love our children more than anything. I know you do too. We just have a very clear, obvious difference here in what it means to keep our children safe and to teach them values and who's in charge of that. We believe that it is our right as parents to do that. And the state has no place. And do you think it's any coincidence? Do you think you're doing any overreach when the legislation, that there's a bill to help so that you don't continue this overreach? Does that mean anything to you? And who was there? I know Kirk Penner was there when the bill was being discussed this week. Is, does that signal Thank anything you, to Stephanie, you? Thank you, Stephanie. Scrap Jennifer these Hicks. standards. We're do we don't want to waste Jennifer our time Hicks. coming to speak with you. My name's Jennifer Hicks. Um, I also wanted to comment on what you had said, um, Jacqueline about there being another side represented. I'm represented by, by what Kirk Penner says and also the people who have been victims of sexual abuse. And so don't assume that we don't understand that side of things, that we, don't, that we who are opposed to those standards don't, aren't reflected in that too. Because it's important, there, like people have said, there are other people too. We, we use words like private parts because they're private for a reason. And so there are ways to talk about those things. And those people that you talked about that came here and gave public comments in favor of the standards, I'm going to tell you what, they're victims. They're victims too. They're victims of something that's been going on for a very long time. And you are contributing to that. And you are predators and enablers. And the, I think it was Brenda that said earlier that um, where did this come from? She said, this is, this is nationwide. This is going on everywhere. It is. This isn't isolated here. I would invite every single one of you to go and look up the Imprimus uh, Hillsdale College document about the Great Reset and then ask yourselves, are you communists or are you useful idiots? Because that is what you are. You're one or the other. You are one or the other. Because what you're doing when you promote comprehensive sexual education that teaches kids that they are sexual from birth, and you promote critical race theory that teaches that we're racist from birth, you're, you're teaching a slavery mindset. You're not teaching freedom. You're not, you're not enabling. You're, you're, not, you're not educating kids. You're destroying them. You're destroying our culture, and I believe that you're doing it deliberately. And you can get that little smirk you have on your face. Are you a communist or are you a youthful idiot? You don't even know. You shrugged your shoulders. You don't even know. I'm going to say useful idiot then. But um, this, this is what it is. Look it up, okay? Maybe you don't realize what you're doing, but you're destroying our country. You're destroying our freedom. And, and we're not going to let you do it, okay? But it's, it's unfair. So you cannot sit here and say that you care about children when you take away their will. You take away their freedom when you control their thoughts. And this started with political correctness. When people were told that their intent and their words were not their own, that someone else got to define what their words meant, that's not freedom. And that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. And you're making everybody conform. And this idea of fairness, this, this is part of this great reset. This, this, this is one of the reasons that this is being pushed. And those of you who are communists and you would admit that, you know this. But fairness Fairness is what creates that divide. When people who get to be the ones who decide what is fair, then they get to control who, who's, who's down here and who is up here. And you're destroying the country. I mean, are you proud of that? You shouldn't be. 
you shouldn't be. You should be ashamed. And you know what? There will be judgment for you either in this world or, or in the hereafter. But there will be accountability. But I, I, I'll just join the other people in praying for you. And I don't, I don't even know what else to say. But Thank you, Jennifer. Lee Todd. Mark Bunkowitz. Good afternoon, school board members. In the last 28 days, you've been able to deliver three major disappointments to the citizens of the state of Nebraska. Number one was your vote on February the 4th against Kirk Penner's motion to scrap the standards permanently. The second was Kirk has been the only school board member who's taken advantage of the invitation that I gave you last month to come to one of our mind polluters documentary screens across the state. We've had 15 of them, many right in your neighborhood. And I haven't been to all of them, but I've been to many. And for the people who've been the local coordinators, not a single one has mentioned that any of you have been there. So it's a major disappointment that you haven't taken advantage of that opportunity. And then a third major disappointment is what your vote this morning that you're going to give yourself permission to continue developing the sex education standards. So you have doubled down, and so you just need to know that Protect Nebraska Children Coalition and Nebraskans for Founders Values will double down as well. So I just want to re-invite you again to come to a Mind Polluters screening I'll send each one of you the invitation for the ones that are in your local area so you don't have to travel a long ways. And uh, we pray that when you attend these screenings that you'll stay for the entire time period, which is an hour and 44 minutes, and then you'll dialogue with your constituents when they're finished so that you'll really have a chance to hear from them and hopefully then the scales will be removed from your eyes. Uh, it would be an ideal opportunity for all of you to mix with your constituents, because remember there's an election in less than 60 days, and elections have consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Gwen Easter. Good afternoon. My name is Gwen Easter. I'm with Safe Haven Community Center, Safe Haven Early Childhood Preschool Education Academy. And, you know, I came up here uh, again to talk to you all, to ask y'all to strap the standards, um, these health standards. Um, you know, I've sat and listened all these months to, to people talk about, you know, protecting LGBTQ and you know, like you, they, these people are saying, 90% of families do not want this in the school system. So it should be scrapped. Um, I attended some years ago, I think it was 2016 or 17, a training. Um, and it was called Unequal Partners, Teaching About Power, Consent, and Healthy Relationships. And it was made up of teachers, um, nurses, uh, all these different, um, te you know, um, educators, you know, and they were um, teaching them how to um, interact with the children. They had bingo games. They had, you know, this uh, <clears throat> activity called the teacup game and all this stuff, just teaching kids how to, uh, how, how to interact in a relationship. First of all, kids, again, like they said, they can't consent to anything. They shouldn't be consenting to anything. And as a child care provider, I'm, I'm disgusted by the fact that you all want, want child care providers, because uh, this is in the PDG grant, you know, about uh, transgender, LGBT, and all this stuff. So let's not say y'all not trying to, to um, uh, uh, manipulate and deceive our children into believing they can change who they are. I am concerned about all our children, and I care and love LGBTQ people, but they're just two people just like we all are. You know, y'all wanna, wanna talk, this is about sex, this is not about love, 
And God does love all those people, and God loves, and we love them too. And that's why we're here standing up for our children and our families, because we do. And you want to talk about mental health? We should get the people help. That's mental health. And the reason why so many kids are struggling is because God put on the inside him. He's on the inside of those children. They belong to him. And they're struggling mentally because this is not normal like y'all want it to be seen. It's not normal for men to be sleeping with each other. It's not normal for women to be doing it. And we want to talk about fornication and, and all those. All of those things are sin. You know, but that's why Jesus died on the cross for all of us. But he, God wants us to change. We cannot be in agreement with all this. The other thing I want to say, you all are standing up uh, uh, for these organizations. That's who you all are really pushing these agendas for uh, the Nebraska Department of Education. You got the Buffett Institute, First Five, Sherwood Foundation, all these other organizations across this nation doing things to push all this adult things on our children. Yep, God gave all of us choices. We can choose life or we can choose death. It is up to us. But our children, our little ones don't have a choice because you all are pushing this stuff upon kids. And it, they, they belong to their parents, not to you all. And I'm gonna ask for all parents in North Omaha, South Omaha, West Omaha, across Nebraska, let's stand together. Let's, let's fight this in the court system. Because you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired of coming up here. I'm tired of what's going on in North Omaha. They're pushing out my business. They're pushing out other daycares so these other learning centers can rise up so that they can indoctrinate our kids. And I'm tired of it. I worked hard for my business, and so did other people. And all these school systems are doing are putting these centers together and, and, and creating these programs to push these types of agendas upon our children. And Thank enough you, is Gwen. enough. Christina, Christina Campbell. Christina Campbell. Sorry, I thought I, thought I heard you, but I wasn't sure. Hello, um, I, Jackie, hi, hi. Um, I worked in the criminal justice system too. I have a criminal justice degree in a prison is where I worked. Maybe I'll tell you some story about pedophiles next time. Probably boil your blood a little bit. Um, I don't really care about L LGBTQ. I love plenty of LGBTQ people. What I care about is teaching sex to kids, period. How many examples do you all need before you listen? As far as I'm concerned, the brave men and women are still coming here. I'm one of them. Where are the rest? The standards that we need to be talking about are y'all's double standards. Last meeting, Deborah Neary said, why doesn't everyone spend some time reading my emails and you'll see dot, 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 in regards to all the supposed support you've supposedly heard about the sex ed standards, et cetera. Hey, Smirky, we did read your emails. That's why we're mad. I just wanted to get that on the record. I'm here because I've heard from four separate teachers now, one of them being a close friend of mine, about how hard it is being a teacher right now. Not for reasons you think, though. Not because we domestic terrorists are making it hard, no. It's because of the culture of the Nebraska public school system toward teachers who decline to get vaccinated by COVID-19 shot, sorry, um, or who actually look into the materials they're given to teach with and the library books they've discovered as a result of the past couple of years. My friend specifically was bullied and isolated by her fellow staff members at the school she teaches at because she declined the shot. She was told she had to wear a mask, yet everyone else at her school, except for the other two, st other two staff members who also declined, didn't have to wear one because they were vaccinated. She faced open ridicule and alienation from her fellow teachers. She was pressured to get the vaccine. She was outcast and forced to use a separate break room. I don't know about you, but where I come from, that's segregation. She also says that, quote from her, COVID has hurt children and set them back socially and emotionally. They are so behind socially and academically and behave so immaturely due to it. No one helps the teachers dealing with behaviors. We are truly on our own. Admin sits back and avoids it. School boards do nothing to help. My friend was in her first year of teaching, which was her lifelong dream, and she wanted to do so well and love it so much and absolutely loves her students. She's a fun, creative elementary school teacher who I would have loved to have as my own teacher. She submitted her resignation last week and will be moving to a different state to give teaching one last shot before she gives up on it entirely. Maybe it's just me, but that's one of the causes of your teacher shortages. Maybe we should talk about that. I also want to address one more thing before I stop. Last meeting, while a brave man read a disturbing excerpt from Lawn Boy, and I believe it was Maureen who said, did you read the whole book? Sorry, but does reading the whole book make one completely inappropriate section okay? 
I have to commend you on your audacity, ma'am. It has to be hard sitting there knowing the heat is on you due to your shady deeds and total disregard for parents. I don't even have kids and I stand up for them more than you do as an elected official. That's all of you, not just you. Except for Kirk. My best suggestion is for you and Deborah both to resign. Both to resign. Finally, I don't hate anyone based on sex, sexuality, preferences, or race. I've got friends of all different backgrounds and beliefs. What I hate is having to come here and talk to you people who don't even listen because you are trying to create a divide. I have 51 seconds left, so real quick, I'll tell you a quick pedophile story. It's pretty cool. One guy was female on the top and male on the bottom. Had to have two separate staff members to search him because you can't touch a member of the same... It's it's, it's long to go into, but anyway, he told me one time that little kids taste great, especially little boys. Just wanted to say that. Okay, Christina Deb Fisbeck. Hi again, I'm Deb Fisbeck. Um, I've got a lot of things to say, and it may come around uh, and make sense at the end, so I hope so. W what is an advocate? Um, the role of an advocate is to offer independent support to those who feel that they are not being heard and to ensure that they are get taken seriously and that their rights are respected. It is also to assist people to accept, access and understand appropriate information and services. I was chairman of the board for Lincoln General Hospital when we built the Child Advocacy Center here in Lincoln. I know the importance of little kids being able to explain to a safe adult. I spent a lot of time. It was very close to me. And even those of you on the board who I've become closer to didn't know that, okay? It's really, really important that you understand that researchers in Indiana University, commissioned by Indiana school officials in 1992, found that those who completed the DARE program, remember the DARE program? Subsequently had significantly higher rates of hallucinogenic drug use than those exposed to the program. That's just a past situation that I was involved in being in school in the 80s. So those of you who are on the board were probably in the 70s and 80s as well, some 90s, 2000s, sorry, Jacqueline. <laughs> um, <sighs> analyzing large amounts of the metadata that showed DARE, dare simply did not work. So we're now 40, 45 years away from that implementation before we know it didn't work. How long are we going to take to understand that this didn't work? I'm going to go back to one of my favorite songs. The journey from your mind to your hands is, is shorter than you're thinking. Be careful if you think you stand, you might be sinking. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father you from up above is looking down on love. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. I just pray that we know what we're doing. You know, um, pornography has the same hallucinogenic values and it needs to be pushed more and more and more. So if we're starting children when they're little, they're gonna need more and more and more of inappropriate behavior, publications, and our viewings to suffice their need for the same feeling. What are we doing? You know, it's okay because the schools and the staff have learned how to manipulate the truth and deceive parents or running programs instead of uh, curriculum because curriculum has to be okayed. It's getting reading materials donated instead of going through program of accepting material by decency. Who makes that decision? Who is the child advocate? 
All children should be respected and be learning math, science, reading, and writing. Teachers are spending so much time on these social programs. The teachers that are preying on children at school were there because staff Thank members and administrators did not do their job I to protect am, uh, the children at this time as an advocate. I am going to uh, see if any of the people who were not here when I called their name initially to see if they happen to be here now. Deborah Oliver. Okay. All right. No. Thank you, though. Thank you. Uh, uh, Lee Todd. Sure. Uh, come on forward, and, and uh, we'll start your four minutes. Uh, my name is Lee Todd. I was uh, born and raised up in northern Nebraska. Um, I guess you could say I'm a farm toughened, hard boiled um, uh, participant in the windswept sand hills, uh, dust laden, whatever. So I've kind of seen what that part of life is like. I told my dad when I was about 18 years old, I didn't want to work as hard, and so I've done some other things. Uh, I am actually the uh, fifth of. Uh, and the best looking of five other siblings, I might say. Uh, they might disagree with that. But I'm here today to talk a little bit about what I perceive to be a problem in the United States. And I'd like to maybe segue straight over to what's going on. And I wonder how many of our students today are aware of what is really happening in the Ukraine and Russia. I wonder how many of them geographically are savvy to know where the Crimea is and why that is significant. I'm wondering how many of our students today are aware of the fact that probably what will happen there is we're going to have a border war between Poland funneling weapons through the United States into Poland into the Ukraine and the bleed over that could occur and lead to a World War III. And yet we're talking about things like CRT, uh, social justice, climate change and things, I don't think we have our priorities straight. And I watch a lot about what's happening in the world and I see where our education is, the United States compared to the rest of the world and third world countries. I mean, folks, we probably spend more on education than any other, maybe you take Saudi Arabia and some of the places like Kuwait, but the last numbers I looked at, $13,000 to educate a child K through 12. 13,000. We pulled our children out of the public school and moved them into a Catholic school at Cathedral of the Risen Christ. We spend 2,000. And I will guess probably, the edu and I watch it like a hawk, that the education system is just as good or if not better. And let's look at the business model that the education system has set up. I don't think what is happening is we're not strategizing, we're not getting a good investment on our, on our money. I really don't. You walk into an average class size of 25 students. Okay, if that's $13,000 a student, 10 times 25, that's 250, another five times 13 is 65. That's $325,000 when I walk into a classroom. I Darn right I want a great teacher. I want the best teachers that are out there for my children. I want Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle, not necessarily in that order. We spend how much for our teachers on a good day? $65,000 maybe, and that's a lot of pay. It's probably less than that. We aren't paying our teachers enough. Where does the other $260,000 go? I've been to school boards and they will tell me, how dare you, Mr. Todd, propose to us that you take money from the children, advocate for uh, voucher programs and alternative choices. How dare you take the money from the children and advocate for these other things? Yeah. And yet that is their very business model that they're instilling upon the, the society that we live in. We're getting a lousy return for our investment. Compared to the third world, we're getting trounced. And yet we have time to teach all this other BS stuff that's going on in schools today. Our parents are what, not competent to do this? This is, this is a disgrace, it is embarrassing, and I am ashamed to be part of what is happening in Nebraska under what's happening right now under the current criteria. 
Our teachers have no choice. All, everything is fed from the top down in the bureaucracy, and they're told what they have to teach, when they have to teach it, and how they have to teach it. And I can't tell you how many teachers I've talked to in the public school that say, Lee, my hands are tied. Yep. Yep. Thank you very much. You're Lee. welcome. <laughs> Matt. Madam, Madam Chair, uh, that ends uh, those who have signed up for public comment. All right, board. Uh, it's time for lunch, 45 minute break to have lunch. So um, let's go have lunch. Robin? Yes. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam Chair. I move that the board go into executive session to deliberate and receive advice of legal counsel concerning item 7.2, consideration of hearing officers' recommended findings and decisions in case number 22-03, Ritter versus Northwest Public Schools. Is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Stevens? Yes. Neary? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Kojons? Yes. Penner? Yes. Goobles? Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Seven yes, one absent. The board will now go into closed session only to receive advice from legal counsel concerning an NDE case number 22-03 Ritter versus Northwest Public Schools. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? Okay, is there a second? Uh, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll read the motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it. Oh, I'll read the okay, motion. Okay, I move to come out of executive session. Okay, is there a second? There is. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Andrea, please call the roll. Goobles? Neary? Yeah. Kojons? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Penner? Yes. Morrison? Yes. Seven yes, one absent. The motion passed. Agenda item 7.2. Is there a motion on item 7.2? Yes, Madam President. <clears throat> I move to adopt the hearing officer's proposed findings of fact, conclusions of law, and recommended decision in NDE case number 22-03, Ritter versus Northwest Public Schools. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on this motion? Andrea, please call the roll. Morrison? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Goobles? Kojons? Yes. Neary? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Penner? Yes. Seven yes, one absent. The motion passes. Agenda items 9.1 through 9. Yeah, we need to take up um, oh. the item that was pulled from consent, item 5.4.A, I think. Oh, yeah, clear and back. Ask if there's a motion. Yeah. Is there a motion on item 5.4, are you sure, A? Yeah, okay. There it is, yeah, grant approvals. Yep. Yes. Yes, Madam President. I move to authorize the commissioner to approve the use of up to $1,560,000 to fund grants to selected educational service units for preschool through grade two support. Is there a second? Second. Any d discussion? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, yes, you do? Okay. So we reviewed this item in our committee meeting and so, hold on. This has been a good day. Um, <laughs> um, 
Okay, so we, we, we discussed this in our committee meeting and part of the conversation is that this is an expenditure of ESSER three funds and I thought that we, it would benefit us as a board to have some dialogue in the future about the remaining funds and how we spend those. I feel like we miss, we've missed opportunities to have dialogue as a board. So for those reasons, I am, after we have discussion, if anyone else has thoughts, I don't wanna um, talk too much, ask that we postpone this to our May meeting, which would give us our April meeting to have some dialogue about the remaining ESSER funds. Any discussion? Deborah? Uh, so I am curious uh, how this impacts the schedule. Uh, is this something that we can delay until our next meeting uh, without too many ramifications? Are you asking me? Yes, Commissioner. All right, yes. So, and again, I wasn't privy. This is what we started to talk about in the committee report, I know. I wasn't privy to that particular discussion, but I believe it's completely appropriate to uh, as 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 uh, I'm going to say, Mrs. Morrison, and I'm, I hope that's the right way. I should address you, Board Member Morrison. <laughs> Unless he divorced me today. <laughs> well, I don't do that as a gotcha. service. For, I don't know. So um, no, I what I I think it's appropriate. I want to make sure. So again, just like we talked before, no intention on my part or the staff's part not to ensure that you have the dialogue and information necessary. And, and I think a really good moment for us to also be able to use what's in April to give you that bigger picture. We haven't had that chance yet in the committee and I would ask the committee to kind of be prepared to, you know, kind of help us make sure that we're, that we present to you the information that you need to make those uh, decisions and have a good dialogue in April. So um, I, I don't see any problem with the, the, that notion. I think you need a motion to, whoops, go ahead. I just want to add a little bit more on to what Jacqueline said. Uh, when we talked in the committee, uh, some of the things that we hope to learn more about are, you know, so we're spending this amount of money. What's going to happen when those ESSER funds are done? Is it going to just drop off? Or what's the impact going to be? Are the ESUs going to be able to sustain? Um, and um, I mean, basically, what are the long-term impacts when it comes to putting this money out there? And did this all evolve from simply COVID? Did we find out all this data that we, they gathered? Did it come because of COVID? Or was all this, this pre-existing condition that we now have this money, which is great to have, um, but what can we do to ensure that it's going to be sustainable? We want it to be sustainable. Uh, and I don't think there was anyone in the committee that is, is not supportive of this. It's just that we wanted more information. And I think this is uh, good for us to do even for future things that we vote upon. You know, what's the impact to our teachers, students, uh, the long term? ramifications of such decisions when it comes to money like this. So the committee had a good discussion and I hope, I think I have a much better understanding of where we want to go with it. Kirk, I hope you do too. We, we were all- It's a great with, discussion. I mean, yeah. Jacqueline's being very consistent in what she's doing. She's asked for this in the past and uh, very well done. Yeah. Patty was not able to be with us yesterday, so I don't know what, um, but it, it was a good conversation and uh, um, we'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lisa. May I ask the commissioner? Yes. Madam President. <coughs> I know we have an accountability, talking to me, accountability system when the money goes to a district. Is that the same kind of accountability that's um, going to be uh, for the ESUs? If not, why not? That's a good question. Let me put it this way. Um, 
uh, there is an accountability with any funds that go there. So when you say for school districts, we have lots of different kind of accountability. It depends on the funding streams too, right? So, but ESUs and school and school districts have to submit certain AFR, that's annual financial reports, lots of those things. But when it comes to grant activities, it's specified within the grant as well. So. I, so I guess the short answer that I've, I'm not done well to paraphrase, that's the one. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I've given you a very long answer, basically say yes, there is accountability metrics, but it is a great question for the committee to also consider in that, yeah. in that dialogue further. Because, and I wanted to know that on the front end, so they know our expectations on the back end when they're going to have to tell us exactly what they've done with that money and if they have uh, data to say how well it worked, they could add that, not as a requirement, but it would be nice to know. Do I have a motion to postpone? Yes. Okay. So at this time, I move to postpone the motion on the floor to the May meeting of the board, the May business meeting of the board. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, second. Yeah, right. All right. We've discussed it, so let's. Uh, you would on discussion on this motion, I think. Do we need a discussion on this motion? Anybody want to add to what we've talked about? The only thing I would say is the reason that we didn't postpone it to April is because I thought April would be a good opportunity to have the larger conversation, and then may we be ready to take up this specific action. All right. Thank you. All right. Call the roll, Laura, please. Johns? Yes. Fricky? Yes. Goobles? Morrison? Yes. Penner? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stevens? Yes. Neary? Yes. Seven yes, one absent. The motion passes. All right. Do we have anything else hidden in here that I've missed? <laughs> no. <laughs> get this done okay item nine. item nine all right I went to ten I went too far okay <clears throat> agenda items 9.1 through 9.3 the next items are for information our information items and written reports for the board and for our information only Num item agenda item number 10 for the good of the order. This section of the agenda is intended for board members to offer informal observations of the work of the State Board. Board members may make brief announcements about attendance at future events for the purpose of informing other, others on the board, other board members. No business or motions or suggested actions of the board may be offered at this point in the agenda nor should board members engage in substantive uh, discussion about other agenda items or introduce new agenda items. Anything for the good of the order? Well, then this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>